Sometimes you have to see to believe and witness history as it unfolds. When the news is breaking, watch with the newsroom of the Washington Post. We explain what's happening and why it matters. Thank you for choosing to watch the headlines as they're being written by our journalists. You can subscribe with a special offer at WashingtonPost.com slash watch. Subscribing through that link lets everyone here from the front lines to the control room know that you care about our continued efforts to inform the public, protect the First Amendment, and foster a healthy democracy. We could not do this without you. fate of Roe v. Wade and Americans' right to an abortion hangs in the balance today as the Supreme Court hears a challenge to the law. It's the biggest abortion case that the nation's most powerful court has heard in a generation. The state of Mississippi wants to ban abortions after 15 weeks, months earlier than current law. This is a special report from The Washington Post. I'm Liddy Casey. Lower courts have not allowed Mississippi's law to go into effect, but now the Supreme Court, with its conservative majority, will entertain the arguments. The Washington Post Supreme Court reporter Robert Barnes is at the court today to cover the oral arguments and witness them firsthand. I recently met up with him outside the court and asked him what is fundamentally at stake today. Well, this is the biggest abortion case that the court has heard in decades. Uh, since the last time it was asked to reconsider the precedent set in Roe v. Wade, which said that a woman had a constitutional right to an abortion. In that case, 1992, Planned Parenthood v. Casey, the court said that states do have an interest in restricting abortion and they have an interest in trying to preserve uh, unborn life, but that uh, a woman has a right to make a decision about abortion that it can't, the states can't impose an undue burden on that woman's right uh, before the time of viability, meaning when the fetus could survive outside the womb. Mississippi and its attorney general argued that the court could uphold the Mississippi law without directly going against those precedents, Roe right. and Casey, but then they got a lot more aggressive. They got a lot more aggressive, and I think we can only attribute that to a change in the makeup of the court. This case was filed at the Supreme Court while Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was still alive. She, of course, was probably the court's biggest defender of abortion rights and certainly would not be counted on to overturn Casey or Roe v. Wade. And so uh, the court kept this case around for a very long time. And after Amy Coney Barrett was confirmed, actually months after that, the court finally said that it was going to accept the case. And so you're right, Mississippi pitched it as you don't have to disturb Roe v. Wade to um, uphold our law. But afterwards, uh, when they filed their merits brief, said, yes, uh, you should get rid of Roe, you should get rid of Casey, you should return this issue to the states. I mean, to get rid of Roe and Casey, to th that would be a massive step in American law. What is Mississippi's main argument? Mississippi's argument is that Roe was wrongly decided 50 years ago, that Planned Parenthood v. Casey just reaffirmed uh, that wrongness, and also that it is proven unworkable. You know, the court every year is called upon practically to look at more uh, abortion restrictions to try to find out which one uh, is unconstitutional, which one meets the tests that was uh, provided in those cases. The Mississippi says that Planned Parenthood v. Casey said this should end, this is a compromise that should end the debate over this divisive issue, or at least we hope it will. And obviously that hasn't been true. And so Mississippi says it's an unworkable standard and the court should just get rid of it. So what is the abortion provider's argument against the Mississippi law? Well, they say that the court has provided a constitutional right to abortion that women have, and men have come to depend upon for 50 years now, and that uh, the court has never taken back a constitutional right that it extended, and that there is no reason for the court to change anything that it's done. It 
defends this viability line, which is going to be a big issue in this case, saying that even with all the advances in medical technology and all the advances in science, the basic idea of viability when a fetus could survive outside the womb or not has not really changed in all that time and that this is the only workable line uh, that the court could come up with. That's Supreme Court reporter Robert Barnes. Now he is in that building today. The oral arguments will be broadcast through audio. The Supreme Court only allows the audio to come through and we'll have that for you live and uninterrupted starting at 10 o'clock Eastern time uh, when we hear this consequential case argued before the justices. Joining me now with more Rhonda Colvin and James Holman. Welcome to you both. Rhonda, you know, the question of what happens in Mississippi is very important to people in Mississippi, but the case also has implications nationwide. How could this fundamentally change abortion law in America? That's really the question that's at the center of today's hearing. This will affect all states, uh, no matter which way it goes. At the, at the very uh, most, this uh, hearing could result in a decision that could overturn Roe, or at least it could uh, gut it or modify it in a way where states are able to interpret their own abortion laws, where they, with Mississippi, uh, has a 15-week ban, another state could have a 10-week ban, or a 12-week, or an 8-week in the case of Texas. So this is something that, uh, when decided, is going to be something that all states are going to be affected by. And even, uh, you know, despite where Americans are on this issue personally, uh, you really have to take note of how significant today is, uh, because this is a constitutional right, Roe versus Wade is a constitutional right that uh, has been on the books for 50 years. So essentially, these justices are going to be hearing arguments that could lead to overturning a constitutional right that has been set up for a number of decades. So that's very important, no matter what side uh, you are on this issue. And uh, another point about states and, and the uh, ramifications that this decision might have. In preparation for this coverage today, I looked into some of the state laws that have been created this year, and 2021 has been a record uh, year for state laws that have been enacted that deal with abortion. There have been 106 state laws that have been enacted in this year alone. That's a record. The last record was a few years ago, and that was 89 state laws. So this is something that states are really seeing a lot of activity in the legislatures where they're trying to uh, interpret abortion laws on their own. And this case right now is something that uh, I imagine all states, all people, uh, a part of these arguments are going to be watching today. Mm. James, let's go to you. You know, there's only one abortion clinic in all of Mississippi, and it stops performing abortions at 16 weeks. Now, the Mississippi law would ban them after 15 weeks. So, so really, it wouldn't necessarily enact a huge change in terms of what happens in that state logistically. But as Rhonda pointed out, it is huge in terms of the precedent it would set for law. Talk to us about trigger laws and, and what state legislators and, and governors across the country have already set up in place should the Supreme Court overrule Roe v. Wade. Absolutely, Libby. The idea of 15 weeks is uh, right into treacherous legal waters that the Supreme Court hasn't touched. Uh, lower courts have repeatedly struck down laws that are considered pre-viability uh, abortions. Even uh, very conservative judges, because of the precedence of Roe and Casey, uh, what you have seen in all those laws Rhonda was talking about is this sort of messy patchwork emerge, where red states have put in place these trigger laws, which would go on the books if the Supreme Court said. Uh, Roe v. Wade is no longer precedent, uh, that, it, it, they are, that it was wrongly decided. Uh, dozens of states would immediately implement laws that are already on the books, uh, massively restricting abortion. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about potential outcomes of the case, but in a more likely scenario where the Supreme Court upholds the 15-week ban but doesn't necessarily say Roe is no longer black law, black letter law, uh, you would see a, a f the floodgates open of states uh, passing legislation to restrict abortion basically as far as the court will let them go. And as uh, Bob Barnes was telling you in that setup piece, you know, they have six justices here and they only need five. And basically what is going to come out of this is whatever five 
of the conservatives on the court will agree to. The question is just how far that goes. But I should say, you know, we, we're talking about states here. This isn't about a federal right to abortion. This is about whether state legislatures can make these decisions. And so you could have a scenario where, for all intents and purposes, abortion is outlawed in red states, but is legal in blue states. And what that would mean, Libby, is that uh, affluent women who are able to travel to the states where abortion is still legal would be able to have access to the procedure and poorer women, disproportionately minorities, would not necessarily be able to travel. And indeed, right now, the Mississippi clinic you mentioned, the only clinic in Mississippi, uh, many, if not the majority of its patients are from Texas because Texas has imposed this uh, very strong law. And so now women from Texas are coming to Mississippi to to secure abortions. Mm. And we are watching to see what the Supreme Court decides, James, on that Texas case. Uh, the Supreme Court heard arguments a few weeks ago asking whether or not that this essentially six week ban in Texas should be allowed to stand. Right now it is the law and we're waiting for the Supreme Court to uh, decide on that issue. That decision could come any time. It was added to the docket late so it doesn't have to wait until the spring as most announcements typically do. Let's go to the outside of the Supreme Court today where you've seen those live images a lot of people gather demonstrators on both sides of the abortion fight and our colleague national reporter Hannah Jewell is talking to folks there Hannah hi there Libby you're right there's people a lot of people out here hundreds of folks from both sides of this uh, discussion this debate here who are gathered and kind of making these competing speeches loudly behind us um, but I'm here first of all to speak with dr. Gabriela Aguilar who's from physicians for reproductive health a group that has come out here today um, Dr. Aguilar, tell me uh, why you decided to be out here this morning. I decided to come here today so that we could remind everybody that abortion is essential health care. It is very common. It is normal. And people who are seeking and opting for abortion are certain of their decisions and they know what's best for them and their families. So you are an OBGYN from New York. Um, tell me what it would mean for your patients or for those like across the country, um, perhaps not in New York. Um, if Roe v. Wade were overturned? That would mean that, um, you know, millions of people across the country wouldn't be able to ex access essential health care that they need and can be life-saving within their own communities. So what we'll see is millions of individuals um, will, you know, essentially be unable to access basic health care. And we, we know that that's going to impact LGBT communities, communities of color, and low-income individuals most. So is it an interesting position to be a, a medical doctor at a debate like this? We see a lot of signs with fetuses. We see a lot of very impassioned, emotional debate. What do you think is, is sort of missing from this debate from the perspective of a, of a medical provider, an OBGYN? I think some of the humanity is missing and compassion is missing. Uh, trust that people seeking abortions know what they're doing. They know what's best for themselves. They know what's best for their families. And then I think another thing that's important is that there is no debate with medicine, science, and public health. There, there are not two sides with that. There's, there's fact and then there's, you know, things that are not truthful. What are some of the things you've heard that you don't think are truthful? Um, I've heard a lot about um, abortion being dangerous and unsafe, um, people suffering or regretting their decisions um, about abortion, and all of those things are untrue and there are um, masses of data to support that uh, many of those myths that are out there are untrue. I've heard a lot of arguments from anti-abortion activists that, um, that, that pregnancy is safer than abortion. What do you say to that? Um, in fact, it's not. You know, We have one of the highest maternal mortality rates in the developed world, and um, it disproportionately affects black individuals. You know, um, Black mothers are dying at rates that are three to four times higher than their you know, white counterparts, and um, that is just categorically untrue. Abortion is incredibly safe. It's safer than having uh, your wisdom teeth taken out or a colonoscopy. Can you explain a little the difference? Because I know that we hear often from abortion rights provider, activists and providers that abortion will continue whether or not it's legal in this country. What, is, what does that look like in a situation in a state, Mississippi, Texas, if legal abortion were restricted the way it is? I think that it will, you know, place an undue burden on individuals to seek either um, abortion care outside of their states and outside of their communities, uh, which we know will harm people financially, spiritually, emotionally, 
And unfortunately, we know that we could go back to a pre-Roe world where uh, people were taking matters into their own hands, and that can be dangerous if not you know, done safely or appropriately. And I think that you know, we will see people dying from abortion again if we go to a pre-Roe world. All right. Thank you so much for speaking with us, Dr. Aguilar. Back to you for now, Libby. Thank you so much, Hannah Jewell, outside the Supreme Court. Rhonda, let's go to you to talk about the role of Congress in all of this. You know, we've talked about this patchwork of laws across the country that states have enacted. So what is the role of Congress in either trying to react or steer the law of abortion in the land? Well, historically, when you look at how Congress has responded to the abortion debate, historically, uh, they have not weighed into uh, Roe. We're making it federal law. Usually, if there is some sort of abo abortion-related vote, it deals with federal funding uh, uh, for use of elective abortions under uh, Medicare. Um, or Medicaid rather, but they haven't really dealt with the issue. However, this past September, the House did pass the Women's Health Protection Act. That was led by Representative Judy Chu of California. She has introduced that bill for the last eight years, and this is the first time that it came to uh, the House floor for a vote. It did pass, it was along party lines, and I spoke to her on Friday about where it goes from here. We already know, uh, of course, that there is a very divided Senate, and this is the type of issue you really couldn't see uh, being taken up or passed uh, in that body. But she gave me some insight on what the state of play is right now. Let's take a listen. Have you been working on senators and, and getting their support? Where's that lie right now? I have an incredible partner on the Senate side, which is Senator Richard Blumenthal of Connecticut. When we introduced the bill in 2013, we did it together and we've introduced it uh, in every subsequent Congress since then. So he's been working very hard on it and that is why it has 48 co-sponsors right now. Nonetheless, I do have to tell you that uh, Senator Bob Casey is still reviewing it. And when you give sort of an elevator pitch to your colleagues who you know, may not want to be associated with a vote on abortion so closely to an election, what do you tell them? If there has been such an emphasis with this last year and a half of pandemic on people's freedom to make a decision about their own body, shouldn't we at least extend that to a woman's right and freedom to choose about what happens to her body? And uh, Representative Chu did tell me she will be there today. There are a number of lawmakers actually in the crowd there uh, today. She said she will be in the courtroom to hear the arguments. Uh, but in the Senate, uh, after the House passed that bill in September, uh, the uh, Senator Chuck Schumer did say that he was going to bring it up for a vote soon. I asked Judy Chu, does she have any more information on what soon means? She said she didn't know. She thinks now would be the time, of course, with the momentum uh, from the, the cases in front of the Supreme Court. She also said June uh, may be a good time, too, to bring it up. Uh, but she talked about Bob Casey there. He's still reviewing it. Uh, and just as a historical side note, his father uh, was governor of Pennsylvania and was the defendant in uh, Planned Parenthood versus Casey, which is something we'll probably hear uh, the justices speak on. Uh, that's a precedent that did uh, uphold uh, Roe versus Wade back in 92. Um, so where we go from here, we're just watching the Senate to see what they're doing. Susan Collins, uh, Republican from Maine, she uh, is supportive of abortion rights. She has said she does not support the House legislation. She wants to protect uh, the rights of doctors who uh, may have a religious objection to giving an abortion. And she wants to make sure there are some protections in the legislation there. Uh, but there is that uh, list of 48 co-sponsors right now on the Senate side, and, and we'll see if this issue uh, has some momentum moving forward. Yeah, and, and James, for a reality check on this, I mean, there's no indication that the Senate would pass any sort of protection of Roe v. Wade anytime soon, especially given the very tight margins. And in fact, conservatives hope if they're able to take back the, the bodies of Congress and the White House, they could do exactly the opposite. Exactly, Libby, and that's the key thing. The filibuster will still be in place. You need 60 votes. Uh, you know, it, it's a hard issue for Democrats like Joe Manchin. In addition to Susan Collins, you've got Lisa Murkowski. The politics are somewhat complicated. Uh, a lot of it really depends on what the Supreme Court decides in this case, whether that has this sort of galvanizing impact on the nation's politics and leads to political backlash. But as I said a few minutes ago, what's most likely is a messy patchwork of state laws. 
let's go now back to outside of the Supreme Court where our colleague Carolyn Kitchener is standing by. She's a Post reporter covering women and gender for the Lily. Caroline, so good to talk with you. You know, uh, you've been interviewing uh, abortion providers and doctors uh, around the country, especially in the South, places like Mississippi and Texas. How concerned are they about the outcome of this case? Oh, they're extremely concerned. I mean, these are people in places where they have to deal with abortion restrictions all the time. Constantly coming out of state legislatures, they have to deal with different design requirements for their clinics. They have to deal with different staffing requirements, and they do. But this is the first time for many of them, they're telling me, that they really believe it's going to be an enter Roe v. Wade. And one by one, their clinics are going to have to close. These are places the, oh, that sorry, you know, many of, I was just going to say, many of them have trigger laws in, in place, which means that you know, the, the second that the Supreme Court overturns Roe, abortion will be instantly illegal in their states. Tell us about Jackson's Women Health Organization. That's that one remaining abortion clinic in Mississippi, and, and it's a clinic at the heart of this case. They're challenging the Mississippi law. Absolutely. The Jackson Women's Health Organization is the only clinic left in Mississippi. It's been the only clinic there since 2004. They're really waging a constant battle on their grounds, constantly outside of this building. It's known as the Pink House because it's bright, Pepto-Bismol pink. There are anti-abortion protesters, hordes of them there every single day. When doctors come in to Jackson Women's Health Organization, they have to wear disguises. They come in in rental cars so that they can't be identified. They wear wigs. There's a lot of fear because there's a lot of aggression. And it, you know, people who are there really tell me it feels very much like a battleground. And it's top administrator, Sharon Brewer, she says, you know, she's, she's seen a lot. She's been working there a very, very long time, but this is the most worried that she has ever been. Tell us about Mississippi's Attorney General, Caroline. Lynn Fitch, uh, a woman attorney general, breaking barriers in her state. She's very anti-abortion, and she's arguing that abortion bans would actually empower women. Can you explain that? Absolutely. So Lynn Fitch is really the face of Mississippi's case. She is you know, the attorney general who has made this argument that actually abortion bans are empowering to women. They allow them to find full fulfillment as both working people in the workforce and as mothers. If you look around here today, you'll see a lot of people holding signs with her slogan on it, empower women, promote life. It's a it's an interesting argument. It's not really one that I had heard before, but it's one that she really hinged her amicus brief on. And so you're 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 hearing a lot about that here today. And finally, Caroline, what will you be listening for today during the oral arguments? I'll really be listening for the questions that we hear from Amy Coney Barrett, Brett Kavanaugh, some of those newer justices that were appointed by Trump. During the Texas case, which, you know, they heard a month ago on November 1st, a lot of people were surprised with some of the questions that came, especially from Amy Coney Barrett and Justice Brett Kavanaugh. They seem more critical of the Texas law than many were expecting, knowing how conservative they are. So I think people today on both sides will be listening, especially to those judges and, and seeing how they seem to perceive this Mississippi ban. and. You know, kind of making, trying to read the tea leaves and, and figure out what they're going to do about it. Caroline Kitchener, thank you so much. Appreciate your reporting. Uh, Rhonda Colvin, let's go to you for more on what we should be listening for in terms of these justices. We've talked about this essentially like a supermajority of conservatives, uh, but there are going to be some very important actors here. Tell us more. Yeah, I think Caroline is right. I, I agree that I think all eyes or ears rather will be on Brett Kavanaugh and Amy Coney Barrett. Uh, I think uh, in that last hearing with, uh, that was over the Texas ban, they did surprise people as Caroline noted, but we have to also remember this is a completely separate set of arguments. That was on 
uh, just the, the fact of the Texas law deputizing citizens to enforce the law, that legal question there. This, however, is about the viability question and whether states can enact uh, bans that are less than the time that Roe covers. So that's, these are, those are two very separate issues. So I think we uh, should provide uh, or put fresh ears toward Amy Coney Barrett and Brett Kavanaugh to hear what they have to say on this issue. Uh, and I think all justices actually, this is gonna be an interesting uh, set of arguments because all justices, given how important and uh, the magnitude of today's hearing is, I think everyone needs to listen to what all these justices say just to get you know hints or clues of what direction the, the court may be going on. James, a phrase we may hear quite a bit today, Latin is uh, stare decisis. Uh, let's talk about what that means and what we should be listening for. So the Supreme Court respects its precedents uh, and, and puts quite a lot of weight in them. And indeed, uh, all of the justices during their confirmation hearings emphasize their respect for stare decisis, which in Latin means respecting the law as it is, as it has been interpreted. Uh, and and Brett Kavanaugh emphasized a respect for stare decisis uh, when he convinced Susan Collins, uh, who supports abortion rights, to vote for his confirmation. She said that she read that as that he wouldn't vote to overturn Roe. Uh, it, it's especially important for the institutionalists, uh, someone like Chief Justice John Roberts, who cares deeply about how the court is perceived in the public eye, that said, uh, the Roberts court, this court with a six conservative majority has shown in a few cases in recent years, a willingness to say that uh, past precedents were wrongly decided and are no longer valid. So it's not totally binding, but I will say, you know, when we're watching these justices today, uh, Brett Kavanaugh clerked for Anthony Kennedy uh, and he, uh, it was Anthony Kennedy who was a, a nominee from Ronald Reagan who uh, was one of the three Republican appointed justices, David Souter and Sandra Day O'Connor, the others, who forged this coalition in KCV Planned Parenthood uh, that created the undue burden standard. Uh, and, and they said in that Casey opinion that they were trying to respect stare decisis and they felt it would be too disruptive to overturn Roe because that was the precedent. So one of the reasons it's, it's worth paying close attention to Kavanaugh, Kennedy, his mentor, uh, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll will the same standards still apply? National video reporter Hannah Jewell has been talking with demonstrators outside the court. Let's go back to her now. Hi, Libby. I'm here with Angelique and Alejandra, who have come all the way from Las Vegas, Nevada, in order to be here to listen to the arguments on the anti-abortion side, you say you are. Tell me about your signs and why you're here. Um, so our signs talk about overturning Roe v. Wade and how it is time for over Roe v. Wade to be overturned. Um, and we are just here to be a presence um, for the pro-life side and to make sure the truth prevails. What is it that has drawn you? This is a long way to come. Why are you? Why did you feel it was important to be here? Um, so I've, I've, I feel it's important to be here. We both feel it's important to be here because um, the truth that life starts at conception and that we should be protecting life at every stage needs to be at the forefront of this uh, discussion. And so we want to make sure that we are a presence here. Alejandro, why, for you, why was it important for you to come all the way from Las Vegas? Uh, for me, it's really important to come out here just to make our voices heard and to be able to, to put in opposition and to show the true presence of the people that support the sanctity of life. And what will it feel like you guys, for you guys, if we know it's a long way away, it will be next year probably when we hear the results of today's uh, deliberations, what would it feel like for you if Roe versus Wade were overturned? Um, it would feel amazing because we could know that we live in a country that protects human life and that sees um, equality among all of humanity in America. So I think it would be a great day for celebration. And what is it that you think that um, abortion rights activists get wrong about your side of this debate? They definitely get wrong the fact that they think we don't um, care about women and that we don't care about other human life. We care about all human life equally, mother and child. Um, and so when Roe v. Wade is overturned, the culture will be overturned as well, the culture, the pro-abortion culture. And so we want not just a, an America that uh, has the law on our side in terms of pro-life, but also the culture. So we have a culture of life as well. Thanks so much for speaking with us. Back to you, Libby. Thanks so much, Hannah. Uh, James, let's talk about who we expect to argue the case for Mississippi. This is the Solicitor General, Scott Stewart. Tell us about him. Yeah, so he was most recently in the national news 
uh, as a lawyer for the Trump administration defending family separation in federal court. Uh, he is, uh, is someone who has argued uh, before the justices before, and, uh, and he's really swinging for the fences with this legal argument. Uh, a year ago, as, as Bob Barnes said at the top of our pre-show, uh, the Mississippi was saying that their law could go into effect while still respecting the precedents of Roe and Casey. Now they have filed an updated brief saying uh, it's time for those precedents to go away. And so he's he's going to be making a very ambitious legal argument, uh, hoping that there there's an audience of five justices on the court who will accept it. Uh, the Mississippi Abortion Clinic will be represented by attorney Julie Reichelman. Uh, she's a litigator uh, for the Center for Reproductive Rights, the litigation director, in fact. And then we'll also hear from the United States Solicitor General, Elizabeth Prelogger, who will also argue on behalf of the abortion provider. Our team here at The Washington Post will join you after the oral arguments with analysis. A reminder, this is audio only because the Supreme Court, while they are allowing the live audio feed, they're not allowing cameras in their courtroom. So our colleague Robert Barnes, who was scheduled to be in there, uh, can't message us from there. No electronic devices are allowed. It's old school pen and pad and uh, and they have to file their reports once they leave uh, that area. Let's go now live to the Supreme Court. Justices of the Supreme Court of the United States. Oh, yay, oh, yay, oh, yay. All persons having business before the honorable the Supreme Court of the United States are admonished to draw near and give their attention, for the court is now sitting. God save the United States and this honorable court. We will hear argument this morning in case 19-1392, Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. General Stewart. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court, Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey haunt our country. They have no basis in the Constitution. They have no home in our history or traditions. They've damaged the democratic process. They poison the law. They've choked off compromise. For 50 years, they've kept this court at the center of a political battle that it can never resolve. And 50 years on, they stand alone. Nowhere else does this court recognize a right to end a human life. Consider this case. The Mississippi law here prohibits abortions after 15 weeks. The law includes robust exceptions for a woman's life and health. It leaves months to obtain an abortion. Yet the courts below struck the law down. It didn't matter that the law, apply, that the law applies when an unborn child is undeniably human, when risks to women surge, and when the common abortion procedure is brutal. The lower courts held that because the law prohibits abortions before viability, it is unconstitutional no matter what. Rowan Casey's core holding, according to those courts, is that the people can protect an unborn girl's life when she just barely can survive outside the womb, but not any earlier when she needs a little more help. That is the world under Rowan Casey. That is not the world the Constitution promises. The Constitution places its trust in the people. On hard issue after hard issue, the people make this country work. Abortion is a hard issue. It demands the best from all of us, not a judgment by just a few of us. When an issue affects everyone, and when the Constitution does not take sides on it, it belongs to the people. Roe and Casey have failed, but the people, if given the chance, will succeed. This court should overrule Roe and Casey and uphold the state's law. I welcome the court's questions. Uh, General Stewart, um, you focus on the right to abortion. Um, but our jurisprudence seems to seem to focus on, uh, in Casey, uh, autonomy, uh, in Roe, uh, privacy. Um, does it make a difference that we focus on privacy or autonomy or, more specifically, on abortion? I think whichever one of those you're focusing on, Your Honor, particularly if you're focusing on, on the right to abortion, um, each of those starts to become a step removed for what's provided in the Constitution. Yes, the Constitution does provide, uh, cert protect certain aspects of privacy, of autonomy, and the like, 
But as this court said in Glucksburg, uh, going directly from general concepts of autonomy, um, of privacy, of bodily integrity uh, to, to a right is not how we traditionally, this court traditionally does due process analysis. So I think it just confirms whichever one of those you look at, Your Honor, uh, a right to abortion is, is not grounded in the text and it's grounded on um, abstract uh, concepts that this court has rejected in, in other contexts as supplying a substantive right. You say that um, uh, this is the only uh, constitutional right that involves the taking of a life. What difference does that make in your analysis? Sure, Your Honor. I, I think it, it makes um, a, a number of differences. One, I, I, I mentioned two in particular. Uh, one is it, it really does uh, mark out the um, unbelievably profound ramifications of this area, which um, in many other areas, assisted suicide, a, a whole host of important areas that are important to dignity, autonomy, freedom, and in, important to pe matters of conscience. It, it marks it out as one of the unique areas where this court has taken that important issue to the people. And it's, it's something that implicates life. And it, it just, I think, marks off Justice Thomas how um, problematic and unusual and how much of a break the court's abor abortion jurisprudence is from those other cases. If we don't overrule Casey or Roe, uh, do you have a standard that you propose other than the viability standard? It would be, Your Honor, um, a clarified version of the undue burden standard. Um, I, I, I would emphasize, I, I think, as Your Honor is alluding to, that no standard other than the rational basis review that applies to all laws will promote an administrable, workable, uh, practicable, consistent jurisprudence that pu puts matters back with the people. I think anything heightened here is going to be problematic. But I, I would say if the court were not inclined to, to overrule Casey, the, the choice would be undue burden standard um, untethered from any bright line viability rule. Well, if, um, uh, I'd, I'd like to go to a different topic, back to Casey. Yes, Your Honor. I assume you've read Casey pretty thoroughly. Yes, Your Honor. And uh, uh, there are two parts. Uh, one is they reaffirm Roe. Put that to the side. The second is an opinion for the court, not for three people, but for the court. And that second part is about what stare decisis principles should be used to overrule a case like Roe. And they say Roe's special. What's special about it? They say it's rare. They call it a watershed. Why? Because the country is divided, because feelings run high, and yet the country, for better or for worse, decided to resolve their differences by this court laying down a constitutional principle, in this case, women's choice. Right, that's what makes it rare. That's not what I'm asking you about. I want your reaction to what they said follows from that. What the court said follows from that is that it should be more unwilling to overrule a prior case. Far more unwilling we should be, whether that case is right or wrong than the ordinary case. And why? Well, they have a lot of words there, but I'll give you about 10 or 20. There will be inevitable efforts to overturn it. Of course there will. Feelings run high. And it is particularly important to show what we do in overturning a case is grounded in principle and not social pressure, not political pressure, only, quote, the most convincing justification can show that a later decision overruling, if that's what we did, was anything but a surrender to political pressures or new members. And that is an unjustified repudiation of principles on which the court stakes its authority. And then there are two sentences I'd like to read, because they say they really mean this, the, the court, not just three. To overrule under fire, in the absence of the most compelling reason, to re-examine a watershed decision would subvert the court's legitimacy beyond any serious question. And the last sentence, after they quote uh, Potter Stewart on the same point, they say overruling unnecessarily and under pressure would lead to condemnation 
the court's loss of confidence in the judiciary, the ability of the court to exercise the judicial power and to function as the Supreme Court of a nation dedicated to the rule of law. Now, that's the opinion of the court. All right? And it's about stare decisis and how we approach it. And I hope everybody reads this. It's at 505 U.S. 854 to 869. All right. What do you say to that? Uh, sure, you're, sure uh, Justice Breyer. I, I would say a couple things. I would say um, we have very closely gone through the factors that the Casey Court itself went through in stare decisis. More than half of our brief is devoted to stare decisis. We now have 30 years in the wake of Casey to see what uh, Casey has done and what it hasn't done. Well, it's um, caused some bad things in the eyes of some people and some good things in the eyes of some people. You your can, Honor. All right, all right, go ahead. You, I'm, I'm sorry, Your Honor. Um, what I'd emphasize, Your Honor, is that uh, to the extent that, that the — I would not say it was the people that, that called this court to end the controversy. The people, um, you know, many, many people um, vocally really just wanted to have the matter returned to them so that they could decide it, decide it locally, deal with it the way they thought best, and at least have a fighting chance to have their view prevail, which was not given to them under Roe and then as a result under Casey. And, and I'd also emphasize, Your Honor, that on, on stare decisis, just as I said, the last 30 years, workability, um, developments in the law, uh, factual developments that states can't account for, uh, I mean, the workability, the undue burden standard alone, many problems. On all the metrics that Casey was describing, or the vast bulk of them, it, Casey fails. And I'd also emphasize this as well, Justice Breyer, that Casey was not um, was, was not a, a great example of simply letting precedent stand. It, it recast Roe's reasoning. It overruled two of the court's most important abortion decisions. Um, it jettisoned the trimester framework of Roe itself and adopted a new standard unknown to other parts of the law. Th those are not the hallmarks of precedent, and they failed under this court's story. Okay, can I take it that your answer is, yes, you accept the way the special rule the rule for the rare watershed, the starry decisis principles for deciding whether to overturn such a case as Roe. You accept that, and you think it's met. I would, right? I, I would say uh, yes in part, your, uh, Justice Breyer. And here's what I'd emphasize, is that I, I do think particularly um, when Casey looked outward and looked to what it see, saw as pressure, there were pressure on all sides. As, as Your Honor noted, this is a hot, difficult issue for everyone. It's, that's why it belongs to the people. And I think the conclusion the court drew from that, that it couldn't provide a, a good enough example, that it would look on principle, those conclusions were, with respect, Justice Breyer, mistaken. And the, the last 30 years has, has not seen any calming of that. It's been very different than some of the others, the court's other uh, controversial decisions that, that have seen Counsel, much more calm. what hasn't been at issue in the last 30 years is the line that Casey drew of viability. There has been some difference of opinion with respect to undue burden, but the right of a woman to choose, the right of, to control her own body, has been clearly set for uh, since Casey and never challenged. You want us to reject that line of viability and adopt something different. Fifteen justices over um, 50 years have, or I should say 30 since Casey, have reaffirmed that basic viability line. Four have said no, two of them members of this court, but 15 justices have said yes, of varying political backgrounds. Now, um, the sponsors of this bill, the House bill in Mississippi, said we're doing it because we have new justices. The newest ban that Mississippi has put in place, the six-week ban, the Senate sponsor said we're doing it because we have new justices on the Supreme Court. Will this institution survive the stench that this creates in the public perception that 
the Constitution and its reading are just political acts. I, I, I don't see how it is possible. It's what Casey talked about when it talked about watershed decisions. Some of them, Brown versus Board of Education it mentioned, and this one have such an entrenched set of expectations in our society that this is what the court decided, this is what we will follow, that, the, that we won't be able to survive if people believe that everything, including New York versus Sullivan, um, I could name any other set of rights, including the Second Amendment, by the way. There are many political people who believe the court erred in um, seeing this as a personal right as, the, as opposed to a militia right. If people actually believe that it's all political, how will we survive? How will the court survive? Uh, Justice Sotomayor, I, I think the concern about appearing political makes it absolutely imperative that the court reach a decision well grounded in the Constitution, in text, structure, history, and tradition, and that carefully goes through the stare decisis factors Casey as we've laid out. That. No, it didn't. Casey Honor, went through every one of them. You think it did it wrong. That's your belief. But well, Casey did that. Well, you're, and you haven't added sorry, much to the discussion in your papers as to the errors that Casey made um, other than I disagree with them, Casey. Well, uh, Justice Sotomayor, maybe I can, I can highlight two. Uh, Casey gave one paragraph to the workability of Roe. It then adopted the undue burden standard, which is perhaps the most unworkable standard in American law. It gave about three paragraphs, if memory serves, to reliance, which doesn't account for uh, the last 30 years and the changes that have occurred since Casey. Um, it, it, it gave a brief factual view to things that have changed since Roe. Those, of course, uh, are not going to take account of the last 30 years of advancements in medicine, science, all of those things. What are the advancements in medicine? I think it's a, an advancement in, in knowledge and concern about such things as uh, fetal pain, what we know the child is doing and looks like and is fully human you know, from a very early in, oh, in regular cases, courts decide whether science fits the Daubert standard. Um, obviously, the, under the Daubert standard, the minority of people, a, a gross minority of doctors, who believe fetal pain exists before 24, 25 weeks. It's a huge minority, and one not well-founded in science at all. So um, I don't see how that really adds anything to the discussion, well, that a small fringe of doctors believe that pain could be experienced before a cortex is formed. Well, Does it mean that there's been that much of a difference since Casey? Uh, we, we pointed out as an example, Your Honor, of where Roe and Casey uh, improperly preclude states from taking account for these things. And they should be able to be concerned about, the, about a fact of uh, a, a, an unborn life being poked and then recoiling is, in the way uh, one of us Sir, would recoil. General, I does... Um, uh, was I, I know what it said about viability in Roe, but was viability an issue in the case? I know it wasn't briefed or argued. It, it was. Um, it was not issue an issue. Certainly, the way it is an issue here, Your Honor. I, I think um, it was to the extent that the court had to over had to um, reaffirm Roe. I, the way to read that is something other than dicta would be done. I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. I don't know what that said. Was it an issue in Roe? Oh, in, in Roe? Yeah. I'm sorry, Your Honor. Um, my understanding is no. I mean, the, the law there was uh, didn't have a viability tag. That was inserted by In fact, if I remember correctly, and I, I, it's an unfortunate source, but it's there, uh, in his papers, Justice Blackmun said that the viability line was actually was dicta. Um, and presumably he had some insight on the question. I, I think, and I'd, I'd add, Your Honor, uh, Justice Blackman, and in, in I think as well his papers, pointed out the arbitrary nature of it and, and the line drawing problems and in then, there, too. And then in Casey, Casey said that that was the core principle or the central principle in Roe, viability. It said that after 
tossing out the trimester formula, which many people thought was the core, uh, core principle. But was viability at issue in Casey? I don't think it was squarely at issue, Your Honor. Um, I, again, it's, it's a little hard not to take the court at its word when it emphasized that viability, the, vi the viability is, is the central part of Rose, Rose holding and saying that it is reaffirming that. So we kind of take that as, it's, as it stands, but the court has not, it did not face a law like this, certainly, Mr. Chief Justice. Um, it, May I finish my inquiry? I, uh, of course, Justice Sotomayor. Virtually every state defines a brain death as death. Yet the literature is filled with episodes of people who are completely and utterly brain dead responding to stimuli. Um, it, there's about 40% of dead people who, if you touch their feet, the foot will recoil. There are spontaneous acts by dead brain people. So I don't think that a response to uh, by a fetus necessarily proves that there's a sensation of pain or that there's consciousness. So I go back to my question of what has changed in science to show that the viability line is not a real line, that a fetus cannot survive. And I think that's what both courts below said that you had no experts say that there is any viability before 23 to 24 months. And what I'd say, say is this, Justice Sotomayor, is that the fundamental problem with viability, it's not really something that rests on, on science so much. It's that it, viability is not tethered to anything in the Constitution, in history, or tradition. It's a quintessentially legislative line. A legislature could think that viability makes sense as a, as a place to draw the line, but it's quite reasonable for a legislature to draw Counsel, the line elsewhere. there's so much that's not in the Constitution, including the fact that we have the last word, Marbury versus Madison. There is not anything in the Constitution that says that the court, the Supreme Court, is the last word on what the Constitution means. It was totally novel at that time, and yet what the court did was reason from the structure of the Constitution that that's what was intended. And here in Casey and in Roe, the court said there is inherent in our structure that there are certain personal decisions that belong to individuals and the states can't intrude on them. We've recognized them in terms of the religion parents will teach their children. We've recognized it in, um, in their ability to educate at home if they choose. They just have to educate them. We have recognized that sense of privacy in people's choices about whether to use contraception or not. We've recognized it in <coughs> their right to choose who they're going to marry. I fear none of those things are written in the Constitution. They have all, like Marbury versus Madison, been discerned from the structure of the Constitution. Why do we now say that somehow Roe versus Casey is, Roe and Casey are so unusual that they must be overturned? Well, you're, Justice Sotomayor, I, I, would, I would emphasize two things. When you're going beyond the Constitution, this court has looked closely to. No, what I'm saying is they didn't go beyond the Constitution. Your Honor, they did not deduce those from the structure of the Constitution. They they pointed to the Fourteenth Amendment and and reasoned that um, privacy in Roe, autonomy and similar values in Casey led to a right to abortion. That's not how this court traditionally does things. Even including in the vast run of cases that Your Honor ran through. The court looks to history and tradition, and here those decisively reject the proposition that states cannot legislate comprehensively on abortion before, after viability, and all throughout. So it's, it's history and tradition, Your Honor. And I would also add, Your, Your Honor, that uh, those, those decisions, a, a great many of them draw, you know, not just draw from text, text, history, and tradition, but they draw often clear lines, very workable, um, have not led to the many negative stare decisis factors that we identify here. General, General, would, go ahead. 
Go ahead. Go ahead, Dr. Okay. Barrett. Um, would a decision in your favor call any of the questions, uh, any of the cases, sorry, that Justice Sotomayor is identifying into question? Uh, no, Your Honor. I, I think for a couple reasons. Um, first of all, I think the vast run of those cases, and you, some mentioned from time to time, are thinking Griswold, Lawrence, o Obergefell. These are these are cases that draw clear rules. You can't ban contraception. Can't ban intimate romantic relationships between consenting adults. Can't ban marriage of people of the same sex. Clear rules that have engendered uh, strong reliance interests. Um, and that have not produced negative consequences or all the many other uh, negative stare decisis considerations we pointed out, Your Honor. Also, I, I'd add, none of them involve um, the purposeful termination of a human life. So those two, those two features, stare decisis and termination of a human life, Your Honor, um, puts all of those safely out of reach if the court overrules here. Okay, so we, I'm sorry to interrupt again, but we really might be making progress. I mean, in the part that, that uh, uh, I read, you know, Casey? Yes, sir. Uh, I think they think, go back 150 years, maybe now we could go back 200. They think there have only been two cases, which were what they call the watershed and where these special tough overruling rules apply. You want this to be the third, or do you think there were more? And if so, what were they? Well, Your Honor, I, I think there's quite a bit of difference. I think the question is never, is it bad to overrule, period? You know, surely start. I'm asking you to think, think in, in their terms. There were two they mentioned, you see. But and I, they don't want Casey to, they don't want Roe to be the third. And, and now, in your opinion, you just answered uh, Justice Barrett, or, hey, all these are not rising to that level. Okay? Right, you're are there any that do rise to the level, in your opinion? I think, um, and, I, and I'm not sure that I necessarily agree with the watershed characterization, Your Honor. What I'd say, though, I, I can't think of another that kind of hits the radar, but, but I'd emphasize that the, the problem here is we're, we're dealing with um, a right that doesn't have a basis in constitutional text, and again, very much in conflict with those, with those values, Justice Breyer. I, I'm you. not sure how your answer makes any sense. All of those other cases, Griswold, Lawrence, Obergefell, they all rely on substantive due process. You're saying there's no substantive due process in the Constitution, so they're just as wrong, according to your theater. No, Your Honor, we're quite comfortable with uh, Washington versus Glucksburg and how it analyzes substantive due process, and it looks to text history, it looks to history and tradition to discipline the inquiry well, and make sure. I mean, in Obergefell, there was no history of, of, of same-sex marriage. And I think the court, the, the court pointed out, look, when we, when we were uh, facing Loving versus Virginia. I, I'm not trying to argue that we should overturn those cases. I just think you're dissimilating when you say that any ruling here wouldn't have an effect on those. Respectfully, uh, I, I, that's, that's uh, Do you I think no, that no state is going to think otherwise, that no people in the population aren't going to ch challenge those cases in court? I mean, Your Honor, we'll always have a diversity of views, but I think- That's I think, the point. I think, that, I think that's one that, of the benefits of our society. Isn't that the point? That, that, that there's a diversity of views and people can vigorously debate and make decisions Exactly, and that's, I, I think that's still thing, doing, and that's what we're doing under undue burden, but we haven't been doing it on the viability line. And, and neither one has worked well. The, the viability line discounts and disregards state interests, and the undue burden standard has all, all of the problems that How we've How is emphasized. your interest anything but a religious view? Um, the issue of when life begins has been hotly debated by philosophers, since the beginning of time. It's still debated in religions. Um, so when you say this is the only right that takes away from the state the ability to protect the life, that's a religious view, isn't it? Because it assumes that a fetus is life at when? You're not drawing your, when do you suggest we begin that life? Your Honor, I, I, aside from- I'm putting it aside from religion. I, I, I'll, I'll try to, I, th I think there might be more than one question and I'll do my very best, Justice Sotomayor. Um, I, I think this court in Gonzales pretty clearly recognized that before viability, we are talking with unborn life with a human organism. And I think the philosophical questions Your Honor mentioned 
all those reasons that they're hard, they've been debated, they're, they're, they're important, they're, those are all reasons to return this to the people because the people should get to debate these hard issues. And this court does not in that kind of a circumstance. So when does the life of a woman and putting her at risk enter the calculus? Meaning right now, forcing women who are poor, and that's 75 percent of the population, and much higher percentage of those women in Mississippi who elect abortions before viability, they are put at a tremendously greater risk of medical complications and ending their life, 14 times greater to give birth to a child full term than it is to have an abortion before viability. And now the state is saying to these women, we can choose not only to physically complicate your existence, put you at medical risk, make you poorer by the choice, because we believe what? That Sure, Your Honor. I think to, to answer, I think the the question I think you you led with, and, and then I think it expanded on, but is still on the same issue is as to when does a woman's interest enter? As far as we're concerned, it's there the entire time. Our point is that all of the interests are there the entire time, and Roe and Casey improperly prevent states from taking account and weighing those interests however they think best. We're not General, saying are there are there secular philosophers and bioethicists who take the position that. Uh, the rights of personhood begin um, at conception or at some point other than viability? Um, I, I believe so. I mean, I think there's a wide array, I mean, of, of, of people of kind of all different views and, and of no faith views who, who would reasonably have that view, Your Honor. It's, it's, it's not tied to a religious view, and I don't think were it otherwise, this court's jurisprudence would, on the, this issue would run right into some of its uh, religious exercise jurisprudence. General, um, Justice Breyer started with stare decisis, uh, an important principle in any case, and here for the reasons that Casey mentioned, uh, especially so, um, uh, to prevent people from thinking that this court is a political institution that will go back and forth depending on uh, what part of the public yells loudest, and, uh, and, and preventing people from thinking that the court will go back and forth depending on changes to the court's membership. And what strikes me about this case, um, and, and, and you come here very honestly um, saying, you know, we want you to discard uh, the entire setup, and then even if you don't do that, we want you to discard the viability line, which you've acknowledged again today, Casey says, is the, the heart, the central principle of Roe. And so uh, usually there has to be a justification, a strong justification in a case like this beyond the fact that you think the case is wrong. And I guess what strikes me when I look at this case is that, you know, not much has changed since Roe and Casey that people think it's right or wrong based on the things that they have always thought it was right and wrong for. So the, 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 the rationale behind those cases uh, has something to do with the autonomy and the freedom and the dignity of women to pursue their lives as they wish, to protect their bodily integrity, to make the decisions that are most fundamental to the course of their lives. And, and always in those cases, there was an understanding that there were important interests on the other side in protecting life or protecting the potential for life, whether people saw it one way or the other way, and that there was a difficult question here and a balance to be made. And I mean, it strikes me that people, some people think those decisions made the right balance and some people thought they made the wrong balance. But in the end, we are in the same exact place as we were then, except that we're not because there's been 50 years of water under the bridge, 50 years of decisions, 
saying that this is part of our law, that this is part of the fabric of women's existence in this country, and that that places us in an entirely different situation than if you had come in 50 years ago and made the same arguments. So I guess I just wanted to hear you react to that. Of course, Justice Kagan, thank you. I, I would emphasize a couple things, Your Honor. The fact that so much time has passed, let's say nothing had changed. That's not a point in Roe and Casey's favor. They have no basis in the Constitution. They, they adopt a right that purposefully leads to the termination of now millions of human lives. The, if nothing had changed, they'd be just as bad as they were 30 years ago, 50 years ago. And now we just have decades of damage, and we have a situation where nearly 30 years after Casey, the court uh, unfortunately divides over what Casey, the lead case on, on in the abortion area, even means. The lower courts are left not knowing what to do, as I, I think, and I think kind of a fundamental problem here is I think as Justice Gorsuch mentioned, um, emphasized in his, his uh, opinion in, in June Medical, that the problem for lower court judges is the Constitution doesn't give them an answer to this. There's no neutral rule of law, so judges unfortunately have to look within themselves, and that's just never going to solve this issue. But if the matters return to the people, the people can deal with it, they can work, they can compromise and reach different solutions. But if we don't do that, we're just going to have all this sort of damage, and at some point it's appropriate for the court to say enough, as it has in some of its it, the great overrulings. Um, in, in Brown and in other cases where it said, this is just enough. Justice Harlan had it right in dissent in Plessy uh, when he recognized that, that, that uh, you know, all are, all are equal. And he, similarly here, the state should be able to recognize, hey, there are real values on both sides here. We, we, we think that this one slightly outweighs, that we think that this one slightly outweighs, or we think that there's some balance to be drawn here. But if the court doesn't do that, Justice Kagan, it's just going to be uh, continued damage, and the court will continue to plunge in this political issue. I apologize, Mr. Chief Justice. I've gone no, over. No, no, that's all right. I have just a few little, uh, well, not little, I hope, uh, uh, questions. Um, and the first gets back to the issue of viability. Um, you know, in your petition for cert, your first question, and the only one on which we granted review, was uh, whether all pre-viability prohibitions on elective abortions are unconstitutional. And then I think it's fair to say that when you got to the brief on the merits, you kind of shifted gears um, uh, and talked a lot more about whether or not Roe and Casey should be uh, overruled. And I wanted to give you a chance to explain that. Sure, Your Honor. Um, so a couple points. You know, at the petition stage, we were, of course, identifying. We identified for the court three questions. We emphasized, as you do at the search stage, hey, this is important. Only this court can resolve it. Um, we emphasized, I believe, it was five times that the court was at the least going to need to, going to, need to reconsider, revisit, or reevaluate its precedents. And we asked the court to at least get rid of a viability line or any suggestion of a viability line. So uh, we added, however, and we had to take account of the reality that. This argument has not fared well in the lower courts. It's, it's lost in every court of appeals. Um, so, you know, we, we raised the issue in addition, but once the court granted only the first question, we presented every argument as we, you know, signaled we, we would present the, the, the full-blown constitutional merits argument with that fundamental question. So I, I'd emphasize that, Your Honor. It was kind of the shift you go from search stage to merit stage. The court granted one question. That question uh, fairly includes what is the correct Well, it standard? fairly includes the broader arguments you raised. I'm not suggesting that. But on the other hand, it presumably included the viability question as well, because that's what you talked about in that one sentence. And, and, and we, we've addressed that as well, Your Honor. I, what, I, what I'd emphasize here is that the merits arguments of, you know, the validity of Roe and Casey as a, an original matter, is there a viability rule based in the Constitution, those are not that complicated or, 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 or lengthy. The, the harder questions are, you know, should the court overrule and, and take the, that momentous step? And that's why we devote a lot of space to that very important issue. We respect stare decisis and have walked through all those points. But again, focusing on the question presented and arguing, presenting our best arguments for that, that's, that's what we've done, Mr. Chief Justice. On uh, stare decisis, I think the first issue you look at is whether or not the de uh, decision uh, uh, at issue was wrongly decided. I've actually never quite understood how you evaluate that. Is it wrongly decided based on the legal principles and doctrine when it was decided or, or in retrospect? Because Roe, I mean, there are a lot of cases around the time of Roe, not of that magnitude, but the same type of analysis that, uh, that went through 
exactly the sorts of things we today would say were erroneous. But do we look at it from today's — if we look at it from today, today's expected, it's going to be a long list of cases that uh, we're going to say are, were wrongly decided. Well, I'd say, I'd say, Mr. Chief Justice, that um, you, you, look, you can look both, was it wrong at the time, has it been unmasked as wrong by, by new understandings, new knowledge, and any developments. But I, I don't think, as I, I think the colloquy, my colloquy with Justice Barrett indicated, um, the court won't have, have to be looking at, at, at much other, m many other areas because this is an area that has a uniquely problematic set of stare decisis considerations. A lot of other controversial areas or once controversial areas are, are quite settled, clear rules, and don't have those considerations against them. Um, so really, by, by overruling Roe and Casey, the court won't have to go down that road. And a lot of those decisions are quite readily um, groundable in history, tradition, and the court's traditional factors, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, Justice Thomas? Justice Breyer, Justice Alito, Justice Sotomayor, Kate, Justice. Uh, General, I, I just wanted to get your quick sense of how your intermediate positions would work. Um, you know, if basically the viability line was discarded and undue burden became the standard overall, a standard that, according to you, is an unclear one, what that would leave the court with going forward. You know, I'm just sort of thinking about the um, great variety of, uh, dif of regulations that states could pass. So whether one is 15 weeks and one is 12 weeks and one is nine weeks or variation across a wide variety of other dimensions, um, what would that look like coming to the court? How would we, how, how do you think we should we would be able to deal with that or, or, or how would you counsel us to deal with that if the court were to go down that road? Well, I, I think I, th this is not to push back against the end, and I will, will answer your question, Justice Kagan, but part of why we've counseled to overrule full scale is that that's the only way to get rid of a number of the problems that I think Your Honor is alluding to. And that's that when you have the undue burden standard, um, it, it's, it's a very hard standard to apply. It's not objective. The court looks to the record in each case and what's going on. I mean, the, the court in Casey itself said, under this record, this is not an undue burden. Um, you, you couldn't say necessarily for certain that a certain number of weeks one place would be an undue burden but would be okay another place. But again, that is the world we have under Casey. So if the court upholds this law under the undue burden standard, it would be carrying forward those features, which I, 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 and I hope you, I've answered your question, but I think that's, one of the very strong reasons to just go all the way and overrule Roe and Casey, Your Honor. I, I, anyway. Justice Gorsuch? Justice Kavanaugh? I want to be uh, clear about what you're arguing and not arguing. Yes, um, and to be clear, you're not arguing that the court somehow has the authority to itself uh, prohibit abortion or that this court has the authority to order the states to prohibit abortion. As I understand it, correct? Correct, Your Honor. As I understand it, you're arguing that the Constitution's silent and therefore neutral on the question of abortion. In other words, that the Constitution's neither pro-life nor pro-choice on the question of abortion, but leaves the issue for the people of the states or perhaps Congress to resolve in the democratic process. Is that accurate? Right. We're saying it's left to the people, Your Honor. And so for the, uh, if you were to prevail, um, the states, uh, majority of states, or states still could or and presumably would continue to freely allow abortion. Many states, some states, would be able to do that even if you prevail on, under your view. Is that correct? That's consistent with our view, Your Honor. It's, it's one that um, allows all interests to have full voice, and, and many of the abortions we see in certain states that I don't think anybody would think would be moving to change their laws in a more restrictive direction. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Justice Barrett? General, I have a question that is a little bit of a follow-up to one that Justice Breyer was asking you. That's about stare decisis, and I think a lot of the colloquy you've had with all of us has been about the benefits of stare decisis, which I don't think anyone disputes. And of course, no one can dispute because it's part of our stare decisis doctrine that it's not an inexorable command and that there are some circumstances in which overruling is possible. You know, we have Plessy, Brett Brown, we have Bowers versus Hardwick to Lawrence. Um, but in thinking about stare decisis, which is obviously the core of this case, how should we be thinking about it? I mean, Justice Breyer pointed out that in Casey, and in some respects, well, 
it was, a different conception of stare decisis insofar as it very explicitly took into account public reaction. Um, is that a factor that you accept? Are you arguing that we should minimize that factor? And is there a different set of rules? It is true that Casey identified Brown and West Coast Hotel as watershed decisions, but is there a distinct set of stare decisis considerations applicable to what the court might decide as a watershed decision? I don't think there should be a distinct set of, uh, of, of considerations there, Your Honor. I, I think what I, what I emphasize, um, and just to make sure, I, on, on the kind of legitimacy, the court looking outward, I, I think Casey was unusual in that regard. I think it was a mistake, and I think it's something that is uh, kind of in conflict with this uh, court's um, structure and approach as an independent branch looking to the Constitution rather than looking without. And I think that's one reason why traditionally the court is, is in some of its greatest overrulings, it's, it's not looking without. It's saying this was wrong. It was wrong the day it was decided. We know it's wrong today. And it's led to all these terrible consequences. We should get, we should get rid of it. Um, I, so I, I think that that was an unfortunate break. And I think the court, even if the court were to, were to still look at legitimacy, though, Justice Barrett, I think the court could very, very powerfully say, look, our, our legitimacy really de derives from our willingness to stand strong and stand firm in the face of um, whatever is going on and stand for constitutional principle and follow uh, our traditional stare decisis factors to overrule when it's appropriate. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Counsel. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Ms. Rickleman. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court, Mississippi's ban on abortion two months before viability is flatly unconstitutional under decades of precedent. Mississippi asks the court to dismantle this precedent and allow states to force women to remain pregnant and give birth against their will. The court should refuse to do so for at least three reasons. First, stare decisis presents an especially high bar here. In Casey, this court carefully examined and rejected every possible reason for overruling Roe, holding that a woman's right to end a pregnancy before viability was a rule of law and a component of liberty it could not renounce. The question then is not whether Roe should be overturned, but whether Casey was egregiously wrong to adhere to Roe's central holding. Second, Casey and Roe were correct. For a state to take control of a woman's body and demand that she go through pregnancy and childbirth with all the physical risks and life-altering consequences that brings is a fundamental deprivation of her liberty. Preserving a woman's right to make this decision until viability protects her liberty while logically balancing the other interests at stake. Third. Eliminating or reducing the right to abortion will propel women backwards. Two generations have now relied on this right, and one out of every four women makes the decision to end a pregnancy. Mississippi's ban would particularly hurt women with a major health or life change during the course of a pregnancy. Poor women who are twice as likely to be delayed in accessing care, and young people or those in contraception who take longer to recognize a pregnancy. To avoid profound damage to women's liberty, equality, and the rule of law, the court should affirm. Uh, counsel, um, I just have one question. I assume you, uh, from your brief, you're relying on uh, an autonomy theory. Both uh, bodily integrity and the ability to make decisions related to family, marriage, and childbearing, Your Honor. Um, Shortly, some years after we decided Casey, uh, we had a case out of South Carolina, I believe, involved a woman who had been convicted of criminal child neglect because she ingested cocaine during pregnancy. Uh, in her case was post-viability, so it doesn't fit in the facts of this case. If she had ingested cocaine pre-viability, 
and had the same negative consequences to her child. Do you think the state had an interest in enforcing that law against her? The state may have, Your Honor. The state can certainly regulate to serve its interests in fetal life and in women's health. Those particular laws tend to undermine both of those interests because they deter women from seeking prenatal care, which is counterproductive to both their but health. the pre-viability as well as post-viability? No, Your Honor. The, the court has been clear that after viability, states can prohibit abortion except to save No, women's I mean, the, the in my example of criminal child neglect. I understand you. your argument is about abortion. I am trying to look at the issue of bodily autonomy and whether or not she has a right also to bodily autonomy in the case of ingesting uh, an illegal substance and causing harm to a pre-viability fetus. Your Honor, of course, those issues aren't posed in this case. And again, I would say that the states can certainly regulate throughout pregnancy, both before and after viability, um, to preserve uh, fetal life and to preserve the woman's health. The court has said, however, there's, there are other constitutional constitutional issues at stake, for instance, in the Ferguson case, um, that states still can't violate women's Fourth Amendment rights. But again, that's not what this case is about. This case is about a ban on abortion that the state concedes is weeks before viability. And the court has been clear for 50 years that the one thing that states cannot do is to take the decision completely away from the woman until viability. That until that point, it is her decision to make, given the unique physical demands of pregnancy and the life-altering consequences consequences of pregnancy and having a child. Thank you. you. The point you made about the impact on, on women and their place in society, th those were certainly made in Roe as well. What we have before us, though, is a 15-week uh, standard. Are, are you suggesting that the difference between 15 weeks and viability are going to have the same sort of impacts as you were talking about, or as we were talking about in Roe? Yes, Your Honor, I believe they would because um, people who need abortion after 15 weeks are often in the most challenging circumstances. As I mentioned, there are people who have ma perhaps had a major health or life change, a family illness, a job loss, a separation, young people or people who are on contraception or pregnant for the first time and who are delayed and recognizing the signs of pregnancy, or poor women who often have much more trouble navigating access to care. And if they're denied the ability to make this decision because there's a ban after 15 weeks, they will suffer all of the consequences that the court has talked about in the past. And in fact, the data has been very clear over the last 50 years that abortion has been critical to women's equal participation in society. It's been critical to their health, to their lives, their ability to pursue- I'm sorry, what, what kind of data is that? I would refer, uh, refer the court to the brief of The Economist in this case, Your Honor, and it compiles data um, showing studies based actually on causal inference, showing that it's the legalization of abortion and not other changes that have had these benefits for, for women in society. Um, and again, those benefits are uh, clear for education, for the ability to pursue a profession, um, for the ability to well, have- Well, putting that- data um, aside, if you think that the issue is one of choice, uh, uh, that women should have a choice to terminate their pregnancy, um, th that supposes that there is a point at which they've had the fair choice, uh, opportunity to choice. And why would 15 weeks be an inappropriate line? So a viability, it seems to me, doesn't have anything to do with choice. Uh, uh, but if it really is an issue about choice, why is 15 weeks not enough time? For, for a few reasons, Your Honor. First, the state has conceded that some women will not be able to obtain an abortion before 15 weeks, and this law will bar them from doing so. And a reasonable possibility standard would be uh, completely unworkable for the courts. It would be both less principled and less workable than viability, and some of the reasons for that are without viability, there will be no stopping point. States will rush to ban abortion at virtually any point in pregnancy. Mississippi itself has a six-week ban that it's defending with very similar arguments as it's using to defend the 15-week ban, and there are states that have bans. Well, I know, but I'd like to focus on the 15-week ban because that's not a dramatic departure from uh, viability. 
It is the standard that the vast majority of other countries have. Uh, when you get to the viability standard, we share uh, uh, that standard with the People's Republic of China and North Korea. And I don't think you have to be in favor of looking to international law to set our constitutional standards to be concerned if those are your share that particular time period. I think there's two questions there, Your Honor, if I may. First, um, that is not correct about international law. In fact, uh, the majority of countries that permit legal access to abortion allow access right up until viability, even if they have nominal lines earlier. So, for example, Canada, Great Britain, and most of Europe allows access to abortion right up until viability, and it also doesn't have the same barriers in place. What do you mean, even if they have nominal lines earlier? Some countries, Your Honor, have a nominal line of 12 weeks or 18 weeks, but they permit legal access to abortion after that point for broad social reasons, health reasons, socioeconomic reasons. So their regimes really aren't comparable, and they also don't have um, the same type types of barriers that we have here. So if the court were to move the line substan substantially backwards, and, and 15 weeks is nine weeks before viability, Your Honor, it's quite a bit backwards. It may need to reconsider the rules around regulations, because if it's cutting the time period to obtain an abortion roughly in half, then those barriers are going to be uh, much more important. Thank you. Ms. Rickleman, I have a question about the safe haven laws. So petitioner points out that in all 50 states, you can terminate parental rights by relinquishing a child after abortion. And I think the shortest period might have been 48 hours, if I'm remembering the data correctly. So it, it seems to me, seen in that light, both Roe and Casey emphasized the burdens of parenting. And insofar as you and many of your amici focus on the ways in which the forced parenting, forced motherhood, would hinder women's access to the workplace and to equal opportunities. It's also focused on the consequences of parenting and the obligations of motherhood that flow from pregnancy. Why don't the safe haven laws take care of that problem? It seems to me that it focuses the burden much more narrowly. There is, without question, an infringement on bodily autonomy, you know, which we have in other contexts like vaccines. Um, however, it doesn't seem to me to follow that pregnancy and then parenthood are all part of the same burden. And so it seems to me that the choice more focused would be between, say, the ability to get an abortion at 23 weeks or the state requiring the woman to go 15, 16 weeks more and then terminate parental rights at the conclusion. Why, why didn't you address the safe haven laws and why don't they matter? I think they don't matter for a couple of reasons, Your Honor. First, um, even if some of those laws are new since Casey, the idea that a woman could place a child up for adoption has, of course, been true since Roe. So it's a consideration that the court already had before it when it decided those cases and adhered to the viability line. But in addition, um, we don't just focus on the burdens of parenting, and neither did Roe and Casey. Instead, pregnancy itself is unique. It imposes unique physical demands and risk on women and, in fact, has impact on all of their lives and their ability to care for other children, other family members, on their ability to work. Um, and in particular, in Mississippi, those risks are alarmingly high. It's 75 times more dangerous to give birth in Mississippi than it, uh, than it is to have a pre-viability abortion, and those risks are disproportionately threatening the lives of women of color. So are you saying, I, I mean, actually, as I read Rowan Casey, they don't talk very much about adoption. It's a passing reference that that means out of the obligations of parenthood. But as I hear this answer, then, are you saying that it, the right, as you conceive of it, is grounded primarily in the bearing of the child, in the carrying of the pregnancy, and not so much looking forward into the consequences on professional opportunities and work life and economic burdens? No, Your Honor. I believe it's both, and, it, and that is exactly how Casey talked about it. It talked about the two strands of cases that supported the right. One was the strand of cases supporting um, bodily integrity, and it cited to cases like Cruzan and Riggins versus Nevada. And the second was the strand of cases supporting decisional autonomy, and specifically decisions related to childbearing, marriage, and procreation decisions like Griswold, Loving. And so it's really both strands that we're relying on here. May I ask you a question about stare decisis, counsel? Um, your, your colleagues on the other side have emphasized that uh, Casey rejected Roe's trimester framework and replaced it with an undue burden standard. 
they argue that the undue burden standard was uh, not well known to the law before that. Uh, and, and then they argue that the undue burden standard has evolved over time, too, in ways that the court has found difficult to agree upon. In Hellerstadt, for example, they, they, they point out in their briefs that uh, the court seemed to suggest that a court should consider both the benefits and the burdens associated with the uh, proposed restriction. In June Medical, more recently, uh, the court splintered on, on, on that same question. Uh, whether benefits could be considered or only burdens. And so the argument goes that this has proved to be uh, putting aside all the other um, obviously difficult questions in the case, that, that, that the standard itself has proved difficult to administer and that that is relevant to the stare decisis analysis. And I just wanted to give you an opportunity to respond. Yes, Your Honor. The first point I'd like to make is the undue burden test is not at issue in this case. That is the test that applies to regulations, not prohibitions. And the state has conceded that this is a prohibition. In fact, that's the title of this law, is an act to prohibit abortion after 15 weeks. And the only thing that's at issue in this case is the viability line. And the viability line has been enduringly workable. The lower federal courts have applied it consistently and uniformly for 50 years, and the Fifth Circuit here below had no difficulty striking down this law unanimously 3-0. So it's been an exceedingly workable standard. And if I may return to your question, Mr. Chief Justice, a reasonable possibility standard would not be workable. It would ultimately boil down to an argument that states can prohibit a category of women from exercising a constitutional right merely because of the number of people in the category. And that's just not how constitutional rights work. A state would never say that it could ban religious services on a Wednesday evening, for example, simply because most people could attend religious services on another night of the week. So, so I actually just wanted to, uh, th 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 that's helpful, I think. I just want to make sure I understand what you're telling me, counsel, that, that if the court were to, in this case, step past viability and apply undue burden, the undue burden test to uh, regulations prior to viability, you would agree with the other side, I, I think, that that's not a workable standard. Is, is, that, is that a fair understanding of what you're, you're telling the court? No, Your Honor. I, I you think that would be workable? I believe, that, if I may clarify, I believe the undue burden test has been workable for regulations. That I, I, I understand that. I, I, if it were to apply, if the court were to, and I thought this is what you were saying in response to the Chief Justice, but maybe I'm mistaken. Uh, please correct me if I am, but it, what, what, what is your argument against applying the undue burden standard prior to viability? If the undue burden standard, as this court laid out in Casey, which includes the viability line, no, is no, no, I, I'm, I'm asking, I know, I know, we're, we're fighting the hypothetical here, counsel, all right? Accept the hypothetical. Uh, hypothetically, the court were to extend the undue burden standard to regulations prior to viability. Would that be workable or would that not be workable in your view? Without viability, it would not be workable, Your Honor, because it would ultimately, again, always come down to a claim that states can bar a certain category of people from exercising this right simply because of the number of people in the category. And that's not a workable standard, and it's not a, a constitutional I appreciate standard. that clarification. Thank you. <clears throat> Just to follow up on that, uh, I read your briefs, your brief to say that the only real options we have are to reaffirm Roe and Casey as they stand or to overrule them in their entirety. Um, you say that, quote, there are no half measures here. Is that a correct understanding of your brief? Your Honor, it's certainly um, the arguments that the state has presented is what we're responding to there, which is that all of the state's arguments, including their alternatives, which are undue burden without viability, would be the equivalent of overruling Casey and Roe because the viability line is the central holding of those cases. Casey mentioned it no fewer than 19 times. Uh, and, and the court in June Medical just a year ago affirmed that the viability line is the central holding of both Casey and Roe. Well, you, you do emphasize uh, that the court drew the line at viability in Roe and reaffirmed that in Casey. And that is certainly something that we have to take very seriously into consideration. But suppose we were considering that question now for the first time. I'm sure you know the arguments about the viability line as well as I do, probably better than I do. What would you say 
in defense of that line. What would you say to the argument that has been made many times by people who are pro-choice and pro-life that the line really doesn't make any sense, that it is, as Justice Blackman himself described it, arbitrary? The, the woman's, if a woman wants to be free of the burdens of pregnancy, that interest does not disappear the moment the viability line is crossed. Isn't that right? Uh, no, Your Honor. And if I may make a few points to answer your question. First, I think the state views of viability as arbitrary because it completely discounts the woman's interest. But viability. No, no, but does a woman have, does, uh, upon reaching the point of viability, does not the woman have the same interest that she had before viability in being free of this pregnancy that she no longer wants to continue? Viability is a principled line, Your Honor, because in ordering the well, I'm interest— I'm trying to see whether it is a principled line. Yes, you agree with me at least on that point, that a, a woman still has the same interest in terminating her pregnancy after the viability line has been crossed? Yes, Your Honor, but the court balanced the interest, and in okay. ordering and the interest at the state— And look at the interest on, on the other side. The, the fetus— has an interest in having a life, and that doesn't change, does it, from the point before viability to the point after viability? In, in some people's view, it doesn't, Your Honor, but what the court said is that those philosophical differences couldn't be resolved well, in a way— the, that, what I'm, That's what I'm getting at. What is the philosophical argument, the secular philosophical argument for saying this is the appropriate line? There are those who say that the rights of personhood should be considered to have uh, taken hold um, at a point when the fetus acquires certain independent characteristics. But viability is dependent on medical technology and medical practice. It has changed. It may continue to change. No, Your Honor. It is principled because in ordering the interest at stake, the court had to set a line between conception and birth, and it logically looked at the fetus's ability to survive separately as a legal line because it's objectively verifiable and doesn't require the court to resolve the philosophical issues at stake. I just uh, want to focus on stare decisis for a little bit. Um, I found my colleague Justice Breyer's comments uh, quite compelling. Uh, I'm not quite sure how they play out uh, in, in Casey. Um, it is certainly true that we cannot base our decisions on whether they're popular or not uh, with the people. Casey seemed to say uh, we shouldn't base our decisions not only on that, uh, but whether they're going to, whether they're going to seem popular. Um, uh, it, and it seemed to me to have a paradoxical uh, conclusion that the more unpopular the decisions are, the firmer the court should be in not departing uh, from prior precedent. Um, it's sort of a super starry decisis, but it's super starry decisis for what are regarded as, by many, as the most erroneous decisions. Uh, do you think there is that category, is there, or is it just normal starry decisis? I think it is precedent on precedent, Your Honor, because Casey did the stare decisis analysis for Roe, so the question before this court is whether that stare decisis analysis was egregiously wrong. And if I may answer your earlier question about whether viability was squarely at issue in Casey, it clearly was, Your Honor. At pages 869 to 871, the court squarely addressed viability because the government had made the argument that viability oh, no, no, was no, I arbitrary. appreciate that Casey addressed it. Um, uh, but that's different than saying it was at issue. Um, it said it was the central, central principle of Roe because it was pretty much all that was left after they were done dealing with the rest of it. And the regulations in Casey uh, um, had, had no applicability or not depending upon where viability was. They applied throughout the whole range, period. So if they didn't say anything about viability, it's like what Justice Blackmun said uh, uh, in, uh, when discussing among his colleagues, which is a good reason not to have papers out that, that early, um, uh, is that um, uh, they don't have to address the line drawing at all in Roe. And they didn't have to address the line drawing at all uh, in Casey. 
I disagree with that, Your Honor, because the undue burden test incorporates the viability line. That was what the court was assessing the regulations against, whether they imposed a substantial obstacle in the path of a woman before viability. And if a prohibition like this law isn't a substantial obstacle, then nothing would be. So the issue was squarely um, before the court. And in fact, the court said at page 879 that in adopting the undue burden test, it was not disturbing the viability line. It's a very interesting question that I think Justice Barrett raised, too. It's usually just philosophical, but I think it has bite here. Uh, when I read Casey, it's not just one-on-one, -on -one, you know, two is greater than one. Yeah, Casey plus Roe is greater than Roe. It, it's, they're making a point that, that, that we're an institution perhaps more than a court of appeals or a district court. It's Hamilton's point, no purse, no sword, and uh, yet we have to have public support. And that comes primarily, says Casey. I wonder if it was O'Connor who wrote that. I don't know. But it comes primarily from people believing that we do our job, we use reason, we don't look to just what's popular. And that's where you're seeing the paradox. But the problem with the super case, of which we've heard three mentioned, the problem with the super case like this, the rare case, the watershed case, where people are really opposed on both sides, and they really fight each other, is they're going to be ready to say, no, you're just political, you're just politicians. And that's what kills us as an American institution. That's what they're saying. So we're looking at it for that, but we are looking to. And that, they say, is a reason why. A reason why, when you get a case like that, you better be damn sure that the normal starry considerations, sorry to size this overruling, is are really there in spades, double, triple, quadruple, and then they go through and show they're not. OK? What's the paradox? Now, maybe you think I've just made an argument that there isn't one. But really, <laughs> in my head, I'm thinking I'm not sure. There may be one. And I don't know if you've ever thought about this. I don't know if you've ever, if uh, when, when, when that occurred to you, I don't want to overrule the starry, I wouldn't want the court to overrule the starry decisis section of Casey, you say? And that, that's, what, that's what I think is being brought up. And maybe I haven't made it clearer, but I've tried to. <laughs> Yes, Your Honor. I think the point that the court was making was that the fact that some states may continue to enact laws in the teeth of the court's precedent has never been enough of a reason to overrule. And that's true for a number of decisions that the court has issued. The fact that some people continue to disagree with them is not a basis to discard that precedent. Justice Thomas, anything further? <clears throat> Back to my original question. Um, if I, would, I know your interest here is in abortion. I understand that. But if I were to ask you what constitutional right protects the right to abortion, um, is it privacy? Is it autonomy? What would it be? It's liberty, Your Honor. It's the uh, textual protection in the 14th Amendment that a state can't deprive a person of liberty without due process of law. And the court has interpreted liberty to include the right to make family decisions and the right to physical autonomy, including the right to end a previability pregnancy. So it's all of the above. <laughs> Well, the court, that's how the court has interpreted the Liberty Clause for over 100 years in cases going back to Meyer, Griswold, Carey, Loving, Lawrence. Yeah, but uh, I mean, all of those sort of just come out of Lochner. Uh, the, so it's the, we, we've dropped part of it. So I understand what you're saying. But what I'm trying to focus on is if we is to lower the level of generality or at least be a little bit more specific. In the old days, we used to say it was a right to privacy that the court found in the uh, due process, substantive due process 
clause, okay? So, or in substantive due process. And I'm trying to get you to tell me what are we relying on now? Is it privacy? Is it autonomy? What is it? I think it continues to be liberty, and the right exists whatever level of generality the court applies. There was um, a tradition under the common law for centuries of women being able to end their pregnancies. But in addition, when it comes to decisions related to family, marriage, and childbearing, the court has done the analysis at a higher level of generality. And that makes sense, because otherwise the Constitution would reinforce the historical discrimination against women. Thank you. Justice Breyer? Justice Alito? Well, you just mentioned the common law, so let me ask you a couple of questions about history. Did any state constitutional provision recognize that abortion was a right, liberty, or immunity in 1868 when the 14th Amendment was adopted? No, Your Honor, but it had been allowed under the common law for many years. Uh, does any judicial decision at that time uh, or shortly or immediately after 1868 recognize that abortion was a right, liberty, or immunity? There were state high court decisions shortly before then, Your Honor, talking about the ability of women to end a pregnancy before quickening. What's your best case? For the right to end a pregnancy, Your Honor? Mm -hmm. um, allowing a state to take control of a woman's body and force her to undergo the physical demands, risks, and life-altering consequences of pregnancy is a fundamental deprivation of her liberty. And once the court recognizes that that liberty interest deserves heightened protection, it does need to draw a workable line. And viability is a line that logically balances the interests at stake. The brief for the American Historical Association says that abortion was not legal before quickening in 26 out of 37 states at the time when the 14th Amendment was adopted. Is that correct? That is correct, because some of the states had started to discard the common law at that point because of a discriminatory view that a woman's proper role was as a wife and mother, a view that the Constitution now rejects. And that's why it's appropriate to do the historical analysis at a higher level of generality. In the face of that, can it be said that the right to, to abortion is deeply rooted in the history and traditions of the American people? Yes, it can, Your Honor. Again, at the founding, women were able to end their pregnancy under the common law. And in fact, this court in Glucksburg specifically decide, discussed Casey as a decision based on history and tradition. And at note 19, specifically called out and relied on Roe's conclusion that at the time of the founding and well into the 1800s, women had the ability to end a pregnancy. What was the, the principal source that the court relied on in Roe? for its historical analysis. Who was the author of that, uh, uh, of that article? I apologize, Your Honor. I don't remember the author. I know that the court spent many pages of the opinion doing a historical analysis. There's also a brief on behalf of um, several key American historian associations that go through that history in detail, because there's even more information now that supports Roe's legal conclusions. All right, thank you. I think the other side would say that the core problem here is that the court uh, has been forced by the position you're taking and by the, the cases to pick sides on uh, the most contentious social debate in American life and to do so in a situation where they say uh, that the Constitution is neutral on the question of abortion, the text and history that the Constitution's neither pro-life nor pro-choice on the question of abortion. Uh, and they would say, therefore, it should be left to the people, to the states, um, or, or to Congress. Uh, and I think they also then continue, because the Constitution is neutral, that this court should be scrupulously neutral on the question of abortion, neither pro-choice nor pro-life. But because they say the Constitution doesn't give us the authority, we should leave it to the states and we should be scrupulously neutral on the question. And that they are saying here, I think, that we should return to a position of neutrality uh, on that contentious social issue rather than continuing to pick sides on that issue. So I think that's at a big picture level their argument. I want to give you a chance to respond to that. 
Yes, a, a few points, if I may, Your Honor. First, of course, those very same arguments were made in Casey, and the court rejected them, saying that um, this philosophical disagreements can't be resolved in a way that a woman has no choice in the matter. And second, I don't think it would be a neutral position. The Constitution provides a guarantee of liberty. The court has interpreted that liberty to include the ability to make decisions related to child childbearing, marriage, and family. Women have an equal right to liberty under the Constitution, Your Honor, and if they're not able to make this decision, if states can take control of women's bodies and force them to endure months of pregnancy and childbirth, then they will never have equal status under the Constitution. And uh, I want to ask a question about stare decisis uh, and to think uh, about how to approach that here, because there have been lots of questions picking up on Justice Barrett's questions and others. Um, and history helps think about stare decisis as I've looked at it. and. Uh, the history of how the courts applied stare decisis. And when you really dig into it, um, history tells a somewhat different story, I think, than is sometimes assumed. If you think about some of the most important cases, the most consequential cases in this court's history, there's a string of them where the cases overruled precedent. Brown v. Board, uh, outlawed separate but equal. Uh, Baker versus Carr which set the stage for one person, one vote. West Coast Hotel, which recognized the state's authority to regulate business. Miranda versus Arizona, which required police to give warnings when the right to re about the right to remain silent and to have an attorney present to suspects in criminal custody. Lawrence v. Texas, which said that the state may not prohibit same-sex conduct. Knapp versus Ohio held that the exclusionary rule applies to state criminal prosecutions to exclude evidence obtained in violation of the Fourth Amendment. Gideon versus Rain Wainwright, which guaranteed the right to counsel in criminal cases. Obergefell, which recognized the constitutional right to same-sex marriage. In each of those cases, and that's uh, a list and I could go on, and those are some of the most consequential and important in the court's history, the court overruled uh, precedent. And um, it turns out uh, if the court in those cases had, had listened and they were presented in our, with arguments in those cases, adhere to precedent in Brown v. Board, adhere to Plessy, uh, in West Coast Hotel, adhere to Atkins, and adhere to Lochner. And if the court had done that in those cases, uh, you know, this, the country would be a much different place. So. I assume you agree with most, if not all, the cases I listed there where the court overruled the precedent. So the question uh, on stare decisis is why if, and I know you disagree with what I'm about to say in the if, if we think that uh, the prior precedents are seriously wrong, if that, why then doesn't the history of this court's practice with respect to those cases tell us that the right answer is actually to return to the position of neutrality and, uh, and um, not stick with those precedents in the same way that all those other cases didn't. Because of con the view that a previous precedent is wrong, Your Honor, has never been enough for this court to overrule, and it certainly shouldn't be enough here when there's 50 years of precedent. Instead, the court has required something else, a special justification, and the state doesn't come forward with any special justification. It makes the same exact arguments the court already considered and rejected in its stare decisis analysis in Casey, and in fact, there is nothing different. There is no less need today than 30 years ago or 50 years ago for women to be able to make this fundamental decision for themselves about their bodies, lives, and health. Thank you. Justice Barrett? I want to ask you a follow-up question. You know, the chief was asking you about the viability line and if that was the right place, if that's the right line to draw. So let's take it out of the question of stare decisis and imagine that there's a state constitution that's identical to the 14th Amendment's due process clause. Um, and a state Supreme Court has to decide as a matter of state constitutional law um, what the scope of an abortion right is. And the second trimester ends at 27 weeks. And so that state Supreme Court says, we think that the right exists, you know, in, a, in, a, in an absolute sense that the state cannot take away the right up to 27 weeks. And then after that, adopts an undue burden standard. 
as a matter of first principles, is that line acceptable as a matter of constitutional law? Your Honor, it, it may be, but I think that the question in this case of, is whether a line is obviously more principled or obviously more workable than viability because of the stare decisis context. Why, I mean, that's the row framework, basically, the trimester. Why wouldn't that be workable if you pick a line and say the end of the second trimester, 27 weeks, third trimester, state's interests increase? I don't understand why 27 weeks is less workable than 24. I'm not trying to suggest it is, Your Honor. And what I was trying to suggest is that the viability line is a principled and workable line. So to change it, there would have to be a new line that's obviously more principled and more workable. And, and the line that the court has drawn actually- But that's um, stare decisis. I'm asking as a matter of first principles. As a matter of first principle, the viability line makes sense because if the, con the state constitution as is the same- As a matter of prudential judgment. It's not constitutionally required as a matter of first principles because in fact, fact, we could decide to be more protective and say 27 weeks end of the second trimester. You could, Your Honor, but the, the viability line makes sense given the protection for liberty because it, it comes from the woman's liberty interest in resisting state control of her body. And once the court recognizes that interest, it does need to draw a line as it does in many other constitutional contexts like the Fourth and Fifth Amendment. And the viability line, as I mentioned, makes sense because it focuses on the fetus's ability to survive separately, which is an appropriate legal line because it's objectively verifiable and doesn't delve into philosophical questions about about when life begins. Thank you, counsel. General Prelogger. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. For a half century, this court has correctly recognized that the Constitution protects a woman's fundamental right to decide whether to end a pregnancy before viability. That guarantee that the state cannot force a woman to carry a pregnancy to term and give birth has engendered substantial individual and societal reliance. The real world effects of overruling Roe and Casey would be severe and swift. Nearly half of the states already have or are expected to enact bans on abortion at all stages of pregnancy, many without exceptions for rape or incest. Women who are unable to travel hundreds of miles to gain access to legal abortion will be required to continue with their pregnancies and give birth with profound effects on their bodies, their health, and the course of their lives. If this court renounces the liberty interest recognized in Roe and reaffirmed in Casey, it would be an unprecedented contraction of individual rights and a stark departure from principles of stare decisis. The court has never revoked a right that is so fundamental to so many Americans and so central to their ability to participate fully and equally in society. The court should not overrule this central component of women's liberty. Uh, General, would you specifically tell me, uh, uh, specifically uh, state what the right is? Is it specifically abortion? Is it uh, liberty? Is it autonomy? Is it privacy? The right is grounded in the liberty component of the 14th Amendment, Justice Thomas, but I think that it promotes interests in autonomy, bodily integrity, liberty, and equality. And I do think that it is specifically the right to abortion here, the right of a woman to be able to control without the state forcing her to continue a pregnancy, whether to carry that baby to term. I understand we're talking about abortion here, but what is confusing is that we, if, if we were talking about the Second Amendment, I know exactly what we're talking about. If we're talking about the Fourth Amendment, I know what we're talking about because it's written, it's there. What specifically is the right here that we're talking about? Well, Justice Thomas, I think that the court in those other contexts with respect to those other amendments has had to articulate what the text means and the bounds of the constitutional guarantees. And it's done so through a variety of different tests that implement First Amendment rights, Second Amendment rights, Fourth Amendment rights. So I don't think that there is anything unprecedented or anomalous about the right that the court articulated in Rowan Casey and the way that it implemented that right by defining the scope of the liberty interest uh, by reference to viability and providing that that is the moment 
moment when the balance of interest tips and when the state can act to prohibit a woman from, from getting an abortion based on its interest in protecting the fetal life at that point. So the right specifically is abortion? It's the right of a woman prior to viability to control whether to continue with a pregnancy, yes. Thank you. General, I am interested in Justice Kavanaugh's long litany of cases in which we've overruled precedent, and we have. Yet you did call this unprecedented. Um, as I see the structure of the Constitution, the body of it is the relationship of the three branches of government. And then there is the relationship of the federal government to the state. And through our incorporation of the 14th Amendment of the state vis-a-vis -vis the individual, it's the federal government and the state's relationship to individuals. And I see the Bill of Rights, including the 14th Amendment, as basically setting the limits, giving individual freedom to do certain things and stopping the government from intruding um, in those liberties, in those Bill of Rights, correct? Of all of the decisions that Justice um, Kavanaugh listed, all of them invite, virtually except for maybe one, involved us recognizing and overturning um, state control over issues that we said belong to individuals. The right in Miranda to be warned was an individual right, correct? That's right, Justice Sotomayor, and I think that that is a key distinction with the list of precedents that Justice Kavanaugh was relying on. I think that there are really two key distinctions, and the first is that in the vast majority of those cases, the court was actually taking the issue away from the people and saying that it had been wrong before not to recognize a right. And I think that matters because it goes straight to reliance interests. Here, the court would be doing the opposite. It would be telling the women of America that it was wrong, that actually the ability to control their bodies and perhaps the most important decision they can make about whether to bring a child into this world is not part of their protected liberty. And I think that that would come at tremendous cost to the reliance that women have placed on this right and on societal reliance and what this right has meant for further and Reliance point is a, is a good point, and this may be my fault. I'm talking about pages 854 to 863 in the Casey case, and I've already used up too much time. I can't read those pages out loud. But they do not include the list that Justice Kavanaugh had. They do include two. One is Brown, and the second one uh, is uh, West Coast Hotel versus Parish. And you could add the gay rights cases as a third, which would fit the criteria. But there are complex criteria that she's talking about that link to the position in the rule of law of this court. So all I would say is you have to read them before beginning to say whether they are overruling or not overruling in the sense meant there, calling for special concern. Now, uh, they say in those, uh, maybe I'd mentioned too, wait a minute, of course Plessy was wrong when decided, but just a minute. Also remember Plessy said that separate but equal is a badge of inferiority. Uh, no, they said it isn't. Well, all you have to do is open your eyes and look at the South, my friend, and you will see whether it was or it wasn't in 1954. And they made a similar point. They said, are you going to sit here in the middle of the Depression and tell me that, that uh, Lochner, with its uh, other cases, and pure, just about pure, uh, uh, laissez-faire, that we can run the country that way. I mention that because I'd want people to read those 15 pages with care. <laughs> and that's why I said that. If you had anything to add to my plea to read it, please do. 
Justice Breyer, I agree completely. I have read those pages and reread them many times, and I think that this is actually another key distinction from the cases that Justice Kavanaugh was referring to, and that is, as I understand those passages in Casey, the court carefully walked through each and every stare decisis factor that this court focuses on. It looked at workability of the viability rule, doctrinal underpinnings, legal and factual developments, and critically reliance interests, and down the line, it found that the case for reaffirming Roe was overwhelming. And in that situation, when every factor that the court consults to determine whether to retain precedent counsels in favor of retaining it, I think Casey properly perceived that a decision to overrule nevertheless, perhaps based on inclusion, the conclusion that the justices thought the case was wrongly decided in the first instance, would run counter to the ability of stare decisis to function as a cornerstone of the rule of law in this context. But is it your argument that a case can never be overruled simply because it was egregiously wrong? I think that, at the very least, the state would have to come forward with some kind of materially changed circumstance or some kind of materially new argument, and Mississippi hasn't done so in but this really, case. Really? So it suppose is, Plessy versus Ferguson was re-argued in 1897, so nothing had changed. Would it not be as sufficient to say that was an egregiously wrong decision on the day it was handed down, and now it should be overruled? It certainly was egregiously wrong on the day that it was handed down, Plessy, but what the court said in analyzing Plessy to Brown and Casey was that what had become clear is that the factual premise that underlay the decision, this idea that segregation didn't create a badge of infer inferiority, had been entirely mistaken. So is it your answer that we needed all the experience from 1896 to 1954 to realize that Plessy was, was wrongly decided? Would you answer my question? Had it come before the court in 1897, should it have been overruled or not? I think it should have been overruled, but I think that the factual premise was wrong in the moment it was decided, and the court realized that and clarified that when it overruled So it there are circumstances here, in which a decision may be overruled, properly overruled, when it must be overruled, simply because it was egregiously wrong at the moment it was decided. Well, I think every correct. other stare decisis factor, likewise, would have justified overruling in that interest, that actually it would run counter to any notion of reasonable reliance, that it was not a workable rule, that it had become an, an outlier in our understanding of fundamental freedoms. Well, there was, so a, lot of reliance of the on, there was a lot of reliance on Plessy. The, the South built up a whole society based on the idea of white supremacy. So there was a lot of reliance. It was... It was improper reliance, it was reliance on an egregiously wrong understanding of what equal protection means. But your answer is, I, I, don't, I still don't understand, I still don't have your answer clearly. Can a decision be overruled simply because it was erroneously wrong, even if nothing has changed between the time of that decision and the time when the court is called upon to consider whether it should be overruled? Yes or no? Can you give me a yes or no answer on that? This court, no, has never overruled in that situation just based on a conclusion that the decision was wrong. It has always applied the stare decisis factors and likewise found that they weren't overruling in that instance. And, and Casey did that. It applied the stare decisis factors. If stare decisis is to mean anything, it has to mean that that kind of extensive consideration of all of the same arguments for whether to retain or discard a precedent itself is an additional layer of precedent that needs to be relied on and can form a, a stable foundation of the rule of law. General, you've talked a number of times about the reliance interests here, and I think I'd like you to uh, uh, say a little bit more about that, because, you know, sometimes when we talk about reliance interests, it's like there's a rule of law, and you look at it, and you say, oh, somebody will enforce my contract because of this rule, and it has a very kind of grounded quality to it. And as Casey talked about the reliance interests here, they're a little bit more um, airy, and I, I just wanted to get your sense of what are the reliance interests here, and how, does, how do they cash out on the ground? Well, there are multiple reliance interests here, as I think Casey correctly recognized. Casey pointed to the individual reliance of women and their partners who had been able to organize their lives and make important life decisions against the backdrop of having control over this incredibly consequential decision whether to have a child. And people make decisions in reliance on having that kind of reproductive control, decisions about where to live, what relationships to enter into, what investments to make in their jobs and careers. And so I think on a very individual level, there has 
has been profound reliance. And it's certainly the case that not every woman in America has needed to exercise this right or has wanted to. But one in four American women have had an abortion. And for those women, the right secured by Roe and Casey has been critical in ensuring that they can control their bodies and control their lives. And then I think there's a, a second dimension to it that Casey also properly recognized, and that's the societal dimension. That's the, the understanding of our society, even though this has been a controversial decision, that this is a liberty interest of women. It's the case that not everyone agrees with Roe versus Wade, but just about every person in America knows what this court held. They know how the court has defined this concept of liberty for women and what control they will have in the situation of an unplanned pregnancy. And for the court to reverse course now, I think would uh, run counter to that societal reliance and the very concept we have of what equality is guaranteed to women in this country. It is certainly true that um, there can be some planning by some people about pregnancy. People who are raped don't have a choice, whether it's by an outsider or their own husband. And not everybody can afford contraceptives, contrary to um, the, the, your adversary's brief. Um, in fact, 19% um, of the women in Mississippi are uninsured, so they don't have money to pay for contra contraceptives. So, um, but why? Their point in their brief was, you know, contraceptives, if you use them, the failure rate is very small, et cetera, et cetera. How can there be real reliance? So could you address that issue? Of course. So first, this is not a, a new circumstance since Roe and Casey. Contraceptives existed in 1973 and in 1992, and still the court recognized that unplanned pregnancies would persist and deeply implicate the liberty interest of women. But I think even on the facts, the state is mistaken here. A contraceptive failure rate in this country is at about 10 percent using the most common methods. That means that women using contraceptives, approximately 1 in 10 will experience an unplanned pregnancy in the first year of use alone. About half the women who have unplanned pregnancies were on contraceptives in the month that that occurred. And so I think the idea that contraceptives could make the need for abortion uh, dissipate is, is just contrary to the factual reality. You also mentioned, or maybe it was your co-counsel, um, that uh, life changes for women after 15 weeks. That's exactly right, Justice Sotomayor, and I think that this is responsive as well to the questions that the Chief Justice was asking about, in particular, the impact of enforcing a 15-week bar in this case. The court has always looked at that issue by looking at the people for whom the law is a restriction, not those for whom it's irrelevant. So the question is, why would women need access to abortion after 15 weeks, and what is the effect on them? And there are any number of women who cannot get an abortion earlier. They don't realize that they're pregnant. Uh, that's especially true of women who are young or don't have, uh, haven't experienced a pregnancy before, or their life circumstances change, as you refer to, Justice Sotomayor, they lose their job, or their relationship breaks apart, or they have medical complications. Or for many women, they don't have the resources to pay for it earlier. It takes time for them to raise the money or make the uh, appropriate logistical arrangements to be able to take time off work and travel and have childcare. And for all those women in this category who need access to abortion after 15 weeks, the fact that other women were able to exercise their constitutional rights does nothing to diminish the impact on their liberty interests in forcing them to continue with that pregnancy. Thank you. Uh, General, uh, following up on that, um, <clears throat> would that argument be true uh, in terms of viability as well? In other words, what, your discussion of the reliance interests and the ability of um, women and men to control their lives in reliance on um, uh, the right to, to an abortion. Um, the argument would not be as strong, I think you'll have to concede, uh, given what we're talking about, which is not a prohibition. It's a 15-week uh, line. Uh, is that right? Yes. There, you you so have to hypothesize people who have planned their lives according to a 
24 or whatever week limit uh, it is, but not a 15 week limit on abortion, right? Well, I don't think the court has ever analyzed reliance uh, with that kind of parsing. I think here the, I, the, the force of the viability line is that it's clearly demarcated the scope of a woman's protected liberty interest in this context. And the state is not actually asking this court to replace it with a clear 15 week line that would provide some measure of continued protection for this right. They're asking the court to reverse the liberty interest altogether or leave it up in the air. And if that were to happen, then immediately states with six week bans, eight week bans, 10 week bans, and so on would seek to enforce those with no continued guidance of what the scope of the liberty interest is going forward. Well, that may be what they're asking for, but the thing that is at issue before us today is 15 weeks. And um, I just wonder what the strength of your reliance arguments, um, which sounded to me like being based on a total prohibition, uh, would be if there isn't a total prohibition. And as far as viability goes, I don't see what that has to do with the question of uh, choice at all. Well, I think as Casey emphasized in reaffirming the viability line, the court justified that as having both a logical and a biological justification that it marks the point in pregnancy when the fetus is capable of meaningful life. No, that's life. what John Hart Ely explained was a complete syllogism. That's the definition of viability. It's not a reason that viability is a good line. Well, it's focused on the idea of fetal separateness, and I think that that is a line that also accords with the history and tradition in this country of abortion regulation, contrary to the state's arguments here at the time of the founding and for most of early American history, women had an, an ability to access abortion in the early stages of pregnancy, and it was only when the fetus was deemed sufficiently separate the states could act to bar that. So I think that the viability line also aligns with history and tradition in that respect. Justice Thomas? Uh, you heard my um, question to counsel. Uh, earlier about uh, the woman who was convicted of criminal child neglect. What would be your reaction to that uh, as far as her liberty and whether or not the liberty interest that we're talking about extends to her? Well, Justice Thomas, I have to confess that I haven't read the specific case you're referring to, but if I understand the question you were posing, it, it sounds as though the state is seeking to regulate for a child that's been born that was injured while it was inside the womb. And I think that we are not denying that a state has an interest there. We're not denying that a state has an interest here either. Roe recognized that states have interests that exist from the outset of pregnancy, but with respect to this specific right to abortion, there are also profound liberty interests of the woman on the other side of the scale and not being forced to continue with a pregnancy, not being forced to endure childbirth, and to have a child out in the world. And the state's arguments here seem to ask this court to look only at its interests and to ignore entirely those incredibly weighty interests of the woman on the other side. Thank you. Justice Breyer? Justice Lee? No? Justice Gorsuch, anything further? I just want to make sure I understand your response to the Chief Justice. Um, if this court will reject the viability line, do you see any other intelligible principle that the court could choose? Well, I think that it would be critically important, even if this court were to reject the viability line, to reinforce and reaffirm the fundamental and profound liberty interest at that, stake that, here. And I, I'm sorry for interrupting, but that wasn't my question. I understand. I understand you. I understand that point fully. By the end of this argument. I, I, that is deeply clear to me. I understand your position. I, I'm just asking a question about whether you think there would be another alternative line that the government would propose um, or not. And, and you emphasize that if, if 15 weeks were approved, then we'd have cases about 12 and 10 and 8 and 6. And, and so my question is, is there a line in there that the government believes would be principled or not? I don't think there's any line that could be more principled than viability. Uh, you know, I think the factors the court would have to think about are what is most consistent with precedent, what would be clear and workable, and what would preserve the, the essential components of the liberty interest. And viability checks all of those boxes and has the advantage as well as being a rule of law for 50 years. Thank you. That's helpful, counsel. Appreciate it. Justice Kavanaugh? <clears throat> uh, you, you make a very forceful argument. and. Uh, identify critically important interests that are at stake in this issue. No doubt about that. Um, the other side says, though, that there are two interests at stake, that there's also the interest in, in fetal life uh, at stake as well 
And in your brief, you say that the existing framework accommodates, that's your word, both the interest of the pregnant woman and the interest of the fetus. And, and the problem, I think the other side would say, and the reason this issue is hard, uh, is that you can't accommodate both interests. Um, you have to pick. That's the fundamental problem. And one interest has to prevail over the other uh, at any given point in time. And that's why this is so challenging, uh, I think. And the question then becomes, uh, what does the Constitution say about that? And I just want to get your reaction to what the other side's theme is, and I've mentioned it in my prior questions. Uh, when you have those two interests at stake, and both are important, as you acknowledge, um, why not, why should this court be the arbiter rather than uh, Congress, the state legislatures, state Supreme Courts, the people, being able to uh, resolve this. And there'll be different answers in Mississippi and New York, uh, different answers in Alabama than California, um, because there are two different interests at stake, and the people in those states might value those interests somewhat differently. Uh, why is that not the right answer? Justice Kavanaugh, it's not the right answer because the court correctly recognized that this is a fundamental right of women. and. The nature of fundamental rights is that it's not left up to state legislatures to decide whether to honor them or not. And it's true different rules would prevail throughout the country if this court were to overrule Roe and, Wade, Roe and Casey, but what that would mean is that women in those states who are refusing uh, to honor their rights and who are forcing them to continue to use their bodies to sustain a pregnancy and then to bring a child into the world will have no recourse other than to travel if they're able to afford it uh, or to attempt abortion out outside the confines of the medical system or to have a child uh, even though that was not the best choice for them and their family. Thank you. Justice Barrett? Um, I have a follow-up to Justice Kagan's question about reliance. I'm just trying to nail down, and, and I asked um, Ms. Ruckelman this question too, but I'm not sure that I fully understand the government's position or um, Ms. Ruckelman's position. So on pages 18 and 19 of your brief, you talk about reliance interests and you quote some of the language from Casey about a woman's ability to participate in the social and economic life of the nation. And I mentioned the safe haven laws to Ms. Rinkleman, and it, it seems to me I fully understand the reliance interests. There are the airy ones Justice Kagan was referring to, and then there are the more spe spe uh, excuse me, specific ones um, about a woman's access to abortion as a backup form of birth control in the event that contraception fails so that she need not um, bear the burdens of pregnancy. But what do you have to say to petitioner's argument that those reliance interests do not include the reliance interests of parenting and bringing a child into the world when maybe that's not the best thing for her family or her career? I think the state is wrong about that, and I, I think where the analysis goes wrong and reliance on those safe haven laws is overlooking um, the, the consequences of, of forcing a woman uh, upon her the choice of having to decide whether to give a child up to, for adoption. That itself is its own monumental decision for her. And so I think that there's nothing new about the safe haven laws, the, or, or at least nothing new about the availability of adoption as an alternative. Roe and Casey already took account of that fact, and I think that there are certainly, of course, all of the, the bodily integrity interests that we've referred to, but also the autonomy interests retain in force as well. Okay, so it's the, the reliance interests in the right to be able to choose to terminate the pregnancy rather than having to terminate the parental rights. I think that that is part of it, yes. And I think for many women, that is an incredibly difficult choice, but it's one that this court for 50 years has recognized must be left up to them based on their beliefs and their conscience and their determination about what is best for the course of their lives. Thank you, General. Thank you, General. A rebuttal, General Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. I'd like to do my best to make three points. Um, first, uh, picking up uh, where, where you just left off, Justice Barrett, on safe haven laws. Um, the respondents in this case, I, I believe, as Your Honor pointed out, have emphasized parenting burdens being a, a lead or the lead um, reason that women seek abortions. I would emphasize safe haven laws, as best I've been able to find, first came into existence in 1999 in Texas. They're now ubiquitous, and you're correct, Justice Barrett, that they relieve that huge burden. I would also add that as to, as to uh, 
burdens um, during pregnancy. Um, I would emphasize that contraception is more accessible and affordable and, and uh, available than it was at the time of uh, Roe or Casey. It serves the same goal of allowing women to decide if, when, and how many children to have. Um, and I would also note, um, just frankly, the lowest cost abortion at Jackson Women's Health is $600 for the abortion. Um, additional costs and further fees. Uh, according to, to my friends, the respondents and their amici, there are also additional costs related to travel, taking off time off of work, accommodations, all of those sorts of things. Um, whether somebody is uninsured or not, um, the costs of contraception are consistently significantly less than those. Number two, I, I think, you, uh, Justice Kavanaugh, you had it exactly right when you, when you used the term scrupulously neutral. I think that's a very good description of what we're asking for here. I think it's um, the problem and the value that has evaded the court and will continue to evade this court under Rowan Casey, but that is exa exactly right. This is a hard issue. It involves, and, and I would emphasize, Your Honor, that as you said, there are interests here on, on both sides. There are interests for everyone involved. This is unique for the woman. It's unique for the unborn child, too, whose life is at stake in all of these decisions. It's unique for us as a society in how we decide if the states get to, get, get to legislate on this issue, how to decide and how to weigh these tremendously momentous issues. In closing, I would say that in his dissent in Plessy versus Ferguson, Justice Harlan emphasized that there is no caste system here. The humblest in our country is the peer of the most powerful. Our Constitution neither knows nor tolerates distinctions on the basis of race. It took 58 years for this court to recognize the truth of those realities in a decision, and that was the greatest decision that this court ever reached. We're, we're running on 50 years of row. It is an egregiously wrong decision that has inflicted tremendous damage on our country and will continue to do so and take innumerable human lives unless and until this court overrules it. We ask the court to do that so in this case and uphold the state's law. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, General. Counsel, the case is submitted. The Honorable Court is now adjourned until Monday next at 10 o'clock. A significant and historic day in America as the Supreme Court considers a Mississippi abortion law that, if allowed, could radically change abortion laws throughout the country. This is a special report from the Washington Post. I'm Libby Casey. The case is now in the hands of the nine Supreme Court justices. We don't expect to hear their decision until 2022 in the time when cases are announced. So for now, let's dive into what we heard today with Post reporter Rhonda Colvin and Post columnist James Homan. Uh, Rhonda, let's start out by talking about like the different factions on the bench, you know, how do we break up and think about the nine justices and how they were aligned coming into this case and then what was significant in their lines of questioning? Yeah, I think you saw a clear line between both sides of the bench, the conservative side and the liberal side. I know at the beginning of the show, we all said that uh, we were all listening out for Judge Kavanaugh, what he might ask, as well as Amy Coney Barrett. And uh, from what we heard from them, I'm not sure if many pro-abortion advocates can uh, take ease with what they heard. Um, for instance, Judge Kavanaugh brought up uh, a list of cases that ignored uh, other precedents and overruled precedents and uh, suggested, why can't we do that in this case? He mentioned Brown versus the Board of Education, Plessy versus Ferguson. Those two cases were about segregation and the court ended up overruling those. So he was applying that standard to potentially how they might view Roe, that maybe Roe, it's time for Roe to be thrown out. Amy Coney Barrett uh, talked about safe haven laws and those are laws uh, where each state protects uh, parents who want to drop an infant off to another individual and they won't be charged with any sort of crime if they do that. Uh, she brought up that being uh, something that could lift the burden from uh, women who may have an unwanted pregnancy. Uh, so both of their comments uh, today, as I said, may not uh, put any minds at ease if uh, people are concerned that this case could overturn Roe or at the least uh, modify it to where states are able to determine how many weeks uh, they would uh, have as an abortion ban. Uh, on the, the liberal side, I think one of the themes that uh, we heard very early actually was Justice Sotomayor uh, bring up the fact that if they decide to overrule Roe versus Wade, 
uh, does this uh, politicize the court? She said, how could we remove uh, the political stench uh, from this? And that's something that uh, Justice Breyer also uh, pointed to as well. So you see that those liberal justices are concerned with this decision and, and what it'll look like to the American people. And that also, while I was listening to that, that reminded me of uh, a post poll uh, that was taken a few weeks ago where we found that 60% of Americans say they believe Roe versus Wade should stay where it is and that's consistent with the same type of polling done in 2005 so it appears that most Americans uh, over half believe that Roe versus Wade should uh, be left untouched at this point um, so as you mentioned we're not going to hear this decision until uh, 2022 so we're all kind of left in suspense but um, both sides uh, both the liberal side of the bench as well as the conservative side of the bench uh, pretty much stayed consistent with the points of views that you might expect. James, let's go to you and dig into this more, th this idea of the factions on the court. You know, we, Rhonda talked about those three liberals. Uh, uh, we heard Justice Sotomayor, Justice Kagan, and Justice Breyer asking probing questions and essentially supportive questions of, uh, of the abortion clinic and of uh, the, the Solicitor General of the United States. But then let's talk about the six conservative justices, because there is the question of coming into this, who were sort of the ones that were assumed to be in favor of overturning Roe v. Wade, and then others who might not be supportive of abortion rights, but might get stopped at this idea of precedent, and as we talked about, stare decisis, what has come before. Yeah, Libby, uh, it, I mean, it was a remarkable and seismic hearing that I think offered quite a window uh, and it would be shocking if the court didn't eviscerate Roe v. Wade based on what we heard, uh, if not overturn it. There are at least five justices who are, seem kind of hostile to both of those precedents, Roe and Casey, uh, and willing, uh, even at the expense of kind of the institutional reputation to overturn them. Uh, the two justices everyone was watching to see sort of where they'd come down on that institutional point Justices Barrett and Kavanaugh uh, both seemed unmoved by those arguments. The question now is how yes, far... Let me just pause you yeah. right there, because the assumption is that there are other justices that are stacked in favor of overturning Roe v. Wade. So let's name who they are yeah. to be specific, and then we'll talk about the three that might be on the fence potentially, or you know, we'll see. So Justices Alito and Thomas have already said publicly and in legal arguments and in past writings that Roe was wrongly overturned. So there's no question they are eager to overturn Roe. Then Justice Gorsuch, who was the first of the three justices that Donald Trump put on the Supreme Court, uh, he, he probably has the clearest paper trail of uh, being amenable to overturning Roe. Uh, Justice Coney Barrett uh, is someone whose background is, is, is kind of in the social conservative movement. She was part of Students for Life at Notre Dame uh, and in college, uh, at, in, at Rhodes College in Memphis. Uh, so sh she is very strongly, personally pro-life uh, uh, in her own uh, kind of formulation, but she has said that that's separate from the legal issue. Uh, so the, the question, you know, so that, that you kind of, you knew we were at four uh, who were willing to go pretty far and then I think the big news of the day is that, uh, you know, Justice Kavanaugh obviously said it was complicated and tried to thread the needle and said they're competing interests. But ultimately, he sort of seemed to glom onto this idea that the Supreme Court should be neutral and leave to each individual state and the people in Congress to make these decisions that aren't enumerated in the Constitution. You heard Kavanaugh say a couple times that in his reading, essentially, the Constitution is neither pro-life nor pro-choice. So what that means, Libby, and, and why this is, you know, really significant, um, and this is one of the most significant Supreme Court oral arguments we've heard in the last decade, uh, is that John Roberts also, frankly, sounded very ready to accept Mississippi's law, uh, which would ban abortion after 15 weeks. The reason that matters is because Roberts is the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. If the Chief Justice is in the majority, he gets to assign who writes the opinion. Uh, so if, if Roberts joins with the other five conservatives, so there are six to three saying the Mississippi law should be upheld, Roberts could sort of tone down or scale back how far the court goes 
uh, and say, you know, this is specific to 15 weeks. You heard Chief Justice Roberts really emphasize the viability standard. You could envision Roberts saying, well, what's changed since Casey and Roe is that there's all these new technologies and a new medical or scientific understanding of abortion and, and fetal pain. Uh, and, and basically, you can see Roberts trying to carve out some kind of middle ground that, uh, you know, that, that holds back how far the court goes, but then it's sort of a six to three decision. On the other hand, uh, if Roberts didn't go along, you could very much envision a five to four court uh, where they say Roe was was wrongly decided and it's overturned. So I, I expect now, you know, that after this argument, the justices go into conference, just the nine of them, no staff, no clerks, no one, uh, and, and they will hash out where they are, and then Roberts will assign someone to write a draft opinion. I would imagine if Roberts is in the majority, he will assign that draft opinion to himself so that he can do what I was just talking about and maintain the institutional interests of the, the court and such. But it, it based on the last two hours, it's incredibly difficult to imagine, if not impossible to imagine, uh, the Supreme Court striking down this Mississippi ban on abortion after 15 weeks. We'll talk more about just how that could be decided and what the implications would be in a few moments. But let's go to the outside of the Supreme Court right now where our colleague, national video journalist Hannah Jewell is standing by. Hannah. Hi Libby, things are getting increasingly loud, increasingly emotional here, just outside the steps of the Supreme Court. I'm here with Colleen Harris, who came all the way from Seattle, Washington to be here today. Colleen, I noticed your sign says Catholics support abortion access. Have people been surprised by your sign? Yeah, I've gotten a lot more comments than I realized, and so it made me very proud to be able to hold it up. I think as a Catholic who's always supported um, the right to choose and just reproductive freedom, it's hard sometimes for people to realize that those two things go hand in hand. But it really goes into the fact that healthcare is essential and that it's a Catholic social teaching of being able to have healthcare and have that access for everybody, which is why I really believe that this is a blessing and this is something that I need to be here and support, not just support with words and actions, but actually be here and stand up for every woman who couldn't be here today. And you came a long way, all the way from Seattle, just to do this. You also told me earlier it's your first sort of protest of any kind? It's my first very large one of any kind. I've done some smaller things, but it was very, for months, it was very important for me. I think in the last couple of years I've learned the importance of showing up, not just saying I support a cause, but being able to show up for that cause. And this was one of those things that I knew other on the other side would be very vocalized and very motivated to come, and I needed to come be here and be that voice of a pro-choice Catholic. And, and what is the feeling out here today? As we know, we've been outside. We haven't been able to hear the hearings out here, but um, we know they're going on and we know that they might overturn Roe v. Wade. What does that feel like for you? It's hard because on the one thing, it's this one case, but there's always so many cases in the states. You look at Texas, you look at Florida, you look at all these other states that are putting in these horrible restrictions and that it's, this is the fight right now, but it's a much larger fight than that that we're going to have to keep doing to be able to make sure that every woman has health care. What would you say to those who use Catholicism or religion generally to say that, that, um, that abortion should be banned? I think it goes against a lot of the Catholic social teachings and so I always just push people to go back and looking at those and what that's all really about because Catholic social justice is the roots of what we're doing and like the causes we've been fighting for and that's been something that's been part of Catholicism for years and years and years and we have to have space for that now. I think the stat this morning that it was over 60% of Catholics support abortion rights and having that ability for choice. So I, we have to be here and show up for that because it is a part of Catholicism now and it's it's coming in a way that supports just basic health care and basic human rights for everybody, and this is part of it. All right, thank you so much for speaking with us, Colleen. Back to you, Libby. Thanks so much. Hannah Jewell outside the Supreme Court. We were talking earlier about Justice Brett Kavanaugh and how he is seen as pivotal to this decision. Let's go back and listen to Kavanaugh engaging in a very friendly line of questioning with Mississippi Solicitor General Scott Stewart. I want to be uh, clear about what you're arguing and not arguing. Yes, um, and to be clear, you're not arguing that the court somehow has the authority to itself uh, prohibit abortion or that this court has the authority to order the states to prohibit abortion, as I understand it, correct? Correct, Your Honor. And as I understand it, you're arguing that the Constitution's silent and therefore neutral on the question of abortion. In other words, that the Constitution's neither pro-life nor pro-choice on the question of abortion, but leaves the issue for the people of the states or perhaps Congress to resolve in the democratic process. Is that accurate? Right. We're saying it's left to the people, Your Honor. 
And so for the, uh, if you were to prevail, um, the states, uh, majority of states or states still could or and presumably would continue to freely allow abortion. Many states, some states would be able to do that even if you prevail on, under your view. Is that correct? That's consistent with our view, Your Honor. It's, it's one that um, allows all interests to have full voice and, and many of the abortions we see in certain states that I don't think anybody would think would be moving to change their laws in a more restrictive direction. James Hohen, let's go to you for what that tape reveals. It, it is incredibly revealing because it, one, shows uh, Justice Kavanaugh sort of rationalizing, taking this position uh, that kind of trying to make the argument that it's not as radical as it may seem and that it's about neutrality. Uh, you know, what Kavanaugh is not grappling with there, but did later uh, when the Solicitor General was, was talking, is that, you know, the idea of neutrality means you're essentially saying women don't have uh, the, a fundamental right to this, that it, you're, you're denying that the liberty argument under the 14th Amendment uh, is, is valid. Uh, basically, you know, state legislators aren't allowed to restrict fundamental rights, and this would be allowing them to do that. But clearly, Kavanaugh trying to signal uh, that, that he is a, a full-throated participant in what has been a 40-year conservative legal project to overturn Roe, uh, and, and which he, I, I think, is trying to reassure uh, conservatives that he is, is with them on. Rhonda, let's talk more about that, this idea that uh, Justice Kavanaugh was throwing out there the notion, then he kept sort of contextualize it later as the one side would say, so essentially Mississippi's argument would be um, that staying neutral would mean pulling out of this argument, essentially dismissing Roe v. Wade and allowing the states to decide. How did the Solicitor General of the United States, Elizabeth Prelogger, respond to that and push back on that? Yes, uh, Prelogger, who represented uh, the federal government's side of this, uh, believed that this is, is not something that you should leave up to the states and allow for sort of this patchwork where one state has a 12-week ban, one state has a 15-week ban, and that she also pointed out, too, early in her comments uh, that undoing Roe versus Wade would open up uh, that uh, those trigger laws that we talked about. There are about a dozen states who have laws uh, that say as soon as Roe versus Wade is found unconstitutional, there would be an, an immediate ban in their state uh, when it comes to abortion. Um, so that, that sort of is the, the federal government's take on it. And, and just tacking on to uh, the comments that James made about what uh, Judge Kavanaugh said, when we heard that exchange, it reminded me a lot of what we're hearing uh, over on the legislative branch's side. Uh, yesterday, the uh, Senate GOP had a press conference about uh, this hearing today, and about a dozen senators, Republican senators, showed up. And they, they really centered on the messaging of this case is really not a about abortion itself, but they argue that this case is a state's rights issue, that this is something that each state should be empowered to determine on their own what they, what type of ban they think works for their state, and that you should give power to people, which of course is something that uh, is popular among conservative thought. So when Brett Kavanaugh brought that up, uh, that also does mirror what uh, the conservatives and the Republicans across the street over on the Hill are saying too. Let's go back to Hannah Jewell outside the Supreme Court. Hannah. Hi, Libby. I'm here now with Herbie Newell, who runs the Lifeline Children's Services um, Adoption Agency, an evangelical adoption agency based in the South, you said? That's right. We're based in the South, but serve all 50 states. And so tell me why you came out here today. Yeah, so first to support the state of Mississippi. We have an office in Mississippi, but also because we believe this is a pivotal moment like everyone here and that this really could be the day that we see Roe v. Wade overturned and put back to the states and put back to the legislature. And um, we know we've heard uh, during the, um, the hearings, we heard um, repeated references to the fact that one in four American women get an abortion in their lifetimes. Are there, as someone who runs an adoption service provider, do you have the capacity to, to handle adoptions for potentially adding a lot more were Roe v. Wade overturned? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there are millions and millions of families that are waiting to help, to adopt, or even to foster children to help women get on their feet. Uh, it's not a problem of having enough families uh, for that need. So there's, there's always enough need. As a matter of fact, I had the opportunity to testify before the Alabama Supreme Court and the Alabama legislature to the exact same thing, that in every state, there's an overabundance of families that are willing to help. 
Um, even if with the possibility of an adoption, what would you say to those? I mean, there's many young women out here, particularly who are talking about the pregnancy, not just raising a child, but pregnancy itself is such a sometimes debilitating physical experience. Um, do you think that that women uh, should have to carry babies to nine uh, months? Yeah, I think what I would tell you to that is this. You know, when you look at an abortion, it does one thing. It eliminates a child from a woman, but it doesn't address holistically women from their mental, their physical, their emotional state. And so what we really believe is that from a pro-life side, we need to be addressing women's health care holistically, not just having the answer to be abortion. Abortion takes the life of a child, but doesn't actually do anything for the woman. And I think for sure with medical care that we have, pregnancy is not a, a risk as it was many years ago. And, and we have great health care that can help women through their pregnancy. Why, why do you think this is such an emotional issue? You see uh, groups out here, we were speaking earlier to a Catholic uh, woman who just described herself as Catholic and pro-choice. We've seen um, atheists, leftists who are anti-abortion. Why, why, why is this such a specifically emotional issue in American politics? Yeah, I think first and foremost it's because it exists in the hearts and the minds of the American people. And we really have a deep desire to know when does life begin and when does life start. And, and we have other rules that obviously protect life uh, the, the, in, in a lot of different ways. And so we really have always been looking at when does life begin. I think that is a key component. I think that's why you saw a month ago Texas said it begins at the heartbeat. Mississippi's gone at 15 weeks. But I think what we see, even as you see a lot more young people that are pro-life now, is our technology has caught up. We see that that is a baby. It's not a clump of, 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 of fetal matter. You know, 50 years ago when Roe was first heard, it was the whole idea that this was just a clump of cells. Now we know that this is a baby. And so in the hearts and the minds of the American people, we want to know when does life really begin and who's right Whose rights are we protecting? And we believe we've got to protect the rights of the most vulnerable, which are these babies tucked in their mother's wombs. All right, thank you so much for speaking with us, Herbie. Absolutely. Back to you, Libby. Thank you so much, Hannah Jewell, outside the courthouse. Rhonda, let's go to you for closing thoughts. You know, we won't know the decision here for many months. We're also waiting to see, Rhonda, what the Texas case will yield that the court heard oral arguments on just a few weeks ago. That decision could come sooner. That was sort of added to the docket, so it could come really any time. Uh, what happens now? Yeah, what happens now is, is that we wait. And of course, this decision could come out uh, in the summertime. It, it's certainly uh, those steps uh, where Hannah is right now in front of the Supreme Court, I suspect will be incredibly busy that day or that week when we anticipate that announcement. But I think uh, people on both sides uh, listen to this today and, and try to figure out the way forward uh, for this court. And, and it appears uh, that you, you do have this uh, conservative majority showing their muscle right now. Um, so we, we wait to, to see what the decision is, what they write in the opinions, uh, what their thinking was on this uh, two hour hearing that they just heard. And James, to you for final thoughts, you know, there was a lot of focus on the viability line, which is what is established uh, under uh, court precedent. So there is the question of whether these justices could try to sort of thread this needle and say, well, we're not, you know, totally throwing out everything that's come before us, but we're going to allow this Mississippi case. Um, there, there is a lot of gray area potential for a decision here. Exactly, Libby. And that is the, the key thing that we'll be watching for in the coming months. You know, I, I think it, it, we kind of saw a lot of the justices put their cards on the table, but I should caution, uh, you don't, you can't read too much. Uh, what the justices say in oral arguments is not definitive. I remember uh, 11 years ago uh, when the Supreme Court heard the oral arguments on the Affordable Care Act, it sounded very much like Chief Justice Roberts was uh, ready to get rid of Obamacare, and then he ended up changing course and, and basically changing his vote uh, and becoming the fifth vote to save the law a few months later. And, and so there are machinations that will happen behind the scenes. And I would expect, based on everything we know about him and all of his impulses and everything he said about the institution, that Chief Justice Roberts is going to try to guide the majority uh, toward exactly the outcome uh, scenario that you just described, Libby, which is a, a muddled gray area where there's not going to be an announcement, Roe has been overturned uh, because Chief Justice Roberts feels like that would be really disruptive. It would galvanize the, the popular will. It would turn people against the court. The issue, though, is that Chief Justice Roberts, just like on the ACA, could flip and join the minority, and it would still be the minority. Now there are six conservatives on the court. 
Back then there were five. So that's why this is different than last time. That's why there's uncertainty about what's going to happen. And that's why the, the conversations that are happening behind closed doors this afternoon are going to be so pivotal uh, for, for millions uh, of women and dozens of states that are watching closely to see just how far the Supreme Court will let them go when it comes to restricting reproductive rights. Well, thank you so much to James and Rhonda, and thanks to you for watching these historical, historic oral arguments with the newsroom of The Washington Post. And of course, in addition to thanking my colleagues here in the newsroom, I'd like to thank those who've been outside the Supreme Court today reporting on what's happening. You can continue to follow our coverage of this case in the pages of The Post and on our website. There is extensive coverage there, and we will see you again soon. Thanks for watching. Sometimes you have to see to believe and witness history as it unfolds. When the news is breaking, watch with the newsroom of The Washington Post. We explain what's happening and why it matters. Thank you for choosing to watch the headlines as they're being written by our journalists. You can subscribe with a special offer at WashingtonPost.com watch. Subscribing through that link lets everyone here from the front lines to the control room know that you care about our continued efforts to inform the public, protect the First Amendment, and foster a healthy democracy. We could not do this without you.